minutes in. See you on the lift. Back attack, dude. <laughs> Fun for you! Hey, yo, homies. <laughs> Slide down the big hills. You know what I mean? On the big night, burgundy snowboard. All right, today is an exciting day here at the booth at the Bomb Hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and Run Through a Wall. Smelling salts. We got a special guest host today in studio, Jesse Bertner. How we doing? Uh, what a <laughs> so good to have you in here, Bertner. All the way, uh, five a.m. flight. Yep, love loving it. Love being here. Wouldn't miss it. We we were gonna surprise uh, Yosh, but we we blew the surprise. We'll get into that a little bit. But I'm not for, a vegetarian. You're not. Yeah. No, so we yeah. got yeah we got you S <laughs> eight uh, ribeye sub coming. So you're good. Okay. Uh, how we doing, Silk? I'm doing great. Thanks for having Chris. Oh, man, the sunglasses look great. Yeah. Thank you. How's work the work time only. Yep. How's the mullet? Feels good. Same yeah. same kind of thing every day. Yeah. Just kind of wake up. Looks phenomenal. Party in the back, Amish in front. It's <laughs> 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 exactly what I told the barber. <laughs> <laughs> and the man of the hour, we got Mike Yoshida in studio. Yosh, how we doing? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Man, we're psyched you're here. Woo. For our listeners that don't know who you are, Mike Yoshida is one of the most published and iconic snowboard photographers in its history. He's got countless covers. He was staff photog over at Snowboarder Magazine. He's an X Games gold medalist in photography. Yosh, Yosh also has an infectiously positive attitude and keeps the vibe hilarious at all times, which you guys will experience here. It's going to be a really fun show. So let's get into it. Uh, but I think we dive into the hard-hitting topics right out of the gate. Um Hotmail address. What was your what was your uh, Hotmail email address? I heard it was really solid. Hot, what <laughs> is your Hotmail address? It is not what it is. Well, I, I think it's discontinued by now, but it was meaty underscore moose at hotmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> let's get Dolly on that actually. Yeah, let's go super air horn for that one. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Should we hit a homies cooked while we're at it? Yeah, too? yeah. Let's hit one of those. That, homies cooked. Yeah, that's fire. <laughs> so yeah, can you can you walk us through that name real quick? Because I'm just well, curious. Okay, so in high school, that was my nickname was Moose Meat. Moose Meat. <laughs> yeah. After like, <laughs> you got to explain that a little bit. That, <laughs> this might be too hot for TV. <laughs> Honestly, it's like I don't know what where it came from, but um. This guy, Kobe Linden, you know, you know Kobe from Alaska. Guru. He uh, he was really good at just giving people like random nicknames, and like a lot of the kids that I grew up with, we gave like like animal nicknames. Mm. Like there was like pork face and moose meat, <laughs> and like all this just like random stuff. But one day, Kobe just looked over at me, and he's just like moose meat. <laughs> I was like, and it just stuck. Mm. And so. Originally, I did want moosemeat.com or moosemeat at hotmail.com, but it was taken apparently. Mm-hmm. So I went for the meaty moose. Meaty moose. Yeah. yeah, with the underscore. That's good. Yeah. So, meaty moose, you, you are uh, AK Roots. Where are you from originally? Uh, I'm originally from Homer, Alaska. It's uh, about five hours south of Anchorage. Um, super small town, fishing town on the ocean. Um, prob- I don't know, the population, probably like 6,000 people. But yeah, it's like a mix of when I was growing up, it's like a mix of hippie fishermen slash redneck slash um, a lot of like Russian influence, like Russian um, Orthodox Orthodox. So they had their own village and stuff and just a wild mix. But it's like mostly an artist community. It's like it's it's a really beautiful place. And it's like a lot of cool people and stuff happens out of there. I, I was hearing that your your father's a really interesting cat. How did you how did you end up in Alaska? Well, so <clears throat> it's it's kind of a long story, but my dad originally my dad was in like the whenever the Vietnam War was going on, he was enlisted in the the NOAA service, which is like National Oceanographic Association or whatever. So he would get stationed on these boats and like if he I guess if he was on those boats traveling around, he didn't have to go to war. It was like considered a service. And so he got on these boats and traveled all over and they did all these surveys and he was like not the most like worthy seaman and would just get like super seasick. (laughs) But (laughs) he just toughed it out. And uh, one day they just ended up in Alaska and um, he ended up on the Homer Spit 
and it was just like a gravel road with like nothing there. And, um, yeah, he just loved it. And he was just like, I'm going to move here. And from his roots, he, he grew up in LA. So he just wanted to get as far, far away from like the city as possible, you know? So he, he loves the outdoors and just like fell in love with Alaska. Yeah, that's so rad. Uh, so, so my question to you is how does somebody from Homer, Alaska find snowboarding seeing as though I don't, I mean, Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no mountains, uh, like snowboard resorts close, I guess, right? There's mountains. But, but there's not, yeah, chairlifts, I guess, chairlift <laughs> access. Well, I'll correct you. Olsen Mountain Rope Toe. Okay. Oh. All right. Yeah. And that's... This that's is news uh, to me. Yeah, that's only open, um, I think, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's just run by a ski club, probably 400 vertical feet. Um, cornice at the, at the top, a gully you can build a hip. And then like a, a jump spot like halfway down the, the the face, so, I mean, started snowboarding in the driveway, but I mean if we do yeah we let's get, get into it. I want to yeah. get into snowboarding. Yeah. So I mean I just like I don't know visually I just fell in love with snowboarding and I I wanted to do it and I had a lot of friends who were into skateboarding but I just didn't live close enough to town, town. <laughs> um, I was probably seven miles from any sort of concrete and so we were just up in the hills and so i wanted to snowboard super bad and i just begged my parents one one um christmas and they got me a snowboard but unfortunately it was a black snow <laughs> mogul monster it was a mogul monster <laughs> yes <laughs> and we're talking like all plastic probably an inch thick that was completely hollow grooves in the bottom no metal edges so, I mean, right out, right out of the gates, I'm like set up for failure, right? And um, just tried to ride it down the driveway, which was ice, and would just <laughs> like fall over, fall over. And just like after, I don't know, like an hour, I was just like, yeah, snowboarding sucks. Like I do <laughs> not want, like, it's really hard and I have no idea how to do it and just doesn't work. So like fast forward a couple more years and I finally saved up for like my first metal edge snowboard. I was like not going to give up cause I could see how fun it was. And like a lot of my friends were doing it and like telling me like, yeah, this is fun. And so, yeah, I finally got um metal edge snowboard and then I started going to the rope toe. Amazing. Yeah. What was the first metal edge board? I think it was, a it was a Maro, I think like a pro or something. It was, the one with the symmetrical Maro with the M and the W. So like literally the first year of Maro probably. Yeah. And it was very like pointy, not, not twin tip, you know, pointy tail straight or pointy nose, straight tail, like very like. Did you make a trip into the big city for that? You know what? I think they were, so, they sold snowboards at a bike shop in town. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I, it wasn't like no Gary King. Like, yeah. I mean, I would go up to Anchorage and just like drool over like. <laughs> Some Gary, like you know, they had it all. They had like the sw the Sim Switchblade, the Burton Craig Kelly Mini that I, I could probably ride, and then like a crazy banana, and like they just had a lot of stuff. And I would just be like, someday, one of these days. So <laughs> they had um, Craig Kelly signing autographs in the Gary Kings. <laughs> really? Yeah, Gary Kings is pretty dope. But what year was this? What year are we talking? This is um, this is maybe nineteen ninety. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had a really good friend, like group of friends that liked to snowboard and that were like understood the culture and would be like, we'd go to the video, like, thank goodness for the video store. I think it was uh, Millie's video. And they had every year they would have like the new Mac dog film, the new standard film. And like we would go, you could go and rent them. So we had like a tie to the culture. And um, yeah, we just, you just try and emulate, you know, and it's just like, for us, there was not really, like, there really wasn't a ski resort. I mean, like, you know, Olsen Mountain was so tiny, and it was just one rope toe. So, like, for us to find something similar to what was in the movies, it would be, like, find a switchback, and there's a snowbank, and you just hike up and shape the snowbank out and just, like, launch. That's your jump. That's, like, the Isn't first jump. Isn't that just so funny about Alaska? Like water water everywhere but not a drop to drink you know yeah. like huge mountains everywhere yeah but like our stories are really similar like 
Cooley's story is similar. Like so many street riders coming out of Anchorage and you're like, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, dude, we rode, you know, these guys are riding Russian Jack and riding Hilltop and like small little areas surrounded by gigantic mountains. Just the barrier to entry is such that it's hard to get up in those mountains. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, the, it's like snowmobiling wasn't really an option. I mean, it's just unaffordable and the technology wasn't there. And then just, just the knowledge of like backcountry or like even like split boards didn't exist. So it's just like, yeah, there were huge mountains across the bay. There's like epic mountains, but like, it's just hard to access. Like at that time we didn't, I mean, snowboarding was in its infancy. So it's just like kind of just try and get in where you fit in. But like, we like, found spots and like spots to build jumps like by driving around and like finding drifted in spots and like just you know there is an occasional trip to Alieska, but it was five hours away essentially so on an icy road so it's like that's quite a commitment for a family or anyone really so mm -hmm. It is so interesting. It's like the epicenter like one day you go to Alaska <laughs> and then like your guys Alaska experience is like Hitting a snowbank out of yeah. a driveway. You're like <laughs> straight up. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't know how many times people are like, You're from Alaska. You must just ride in helis and just big mount you like you're like Jeremy Jones, right? And like, no, I like I was like riding in my driveway and just like just building jumps like at a small hill in front of my house. But going airbud golden retriever on them or probably. Probably just grabbing mute until I couldn't. <laughs> Stiffy? <laughs> no stiffy. Oh, shifty. So what did it, so so what was the arc of the of Yosha's Yosha's rise to honing the skills? Where did you go from from backyard boarding? Where did it evolve to? Well, so I started I started being being able to like link turns and then like like a, a lot of my friends were like pretty good and would like get more access to Alieska than me and tell me about like just all the riders like and you would see stuff like you'd see like Jay Liska and like Richie Fowler and kind of a proud Alaskan moment to see that go down, you know? Um, but, uh, this is, I don't talk about this to anyone really, but, uh, um, so when I was in, when I was a freshman in high school, I got busted for drinking and, uh, my parents were super worried as any parent should be, but, uh, they sent me away to school, like to a, like a boarding school. And um, my dad was so guilty. He was just like, oh, I, I don't want to send you to boarding school, but like, what if we send you to like a snowboard school? I was like, all right. Yeah, I guess I could try and do that. And so um, they sent me to a school in Squaw Valley in Tahoe for a year. And dude, it was epic. Like this is... Uh, I believe 92, 92, 93 or somewhere around there. And um, yeah, just access, like I had a freaking season's pass, like access to like a big mountain and just like shredding, you know, like, and like there was like, the school is weird. Like there's like bad kids from like all over, like, and like tons of like rich kids from California coming up that, cause it's in California. So um yeah, it was just like an interesting time, but uh, but yeah, that's where I really like honed my skills, and that's where I really like learned about a lot of the culture because there was magazines coming through, videos like there was like a little TV room where we were just like, it was like TB two and Project Six on repeat, like nonstop, like, and um, that's a lot of Pantera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Pantera. A lot of Pantera. That's the school Whitlake went to, right? So, so that's a funny story because um, so there's like four wings to the school. It's, just, it's like freshmen are on the bottom and then like sophomores and then juniors and seniors. And then, of course, there's like the girls hallway that has like a motion sensor. So like dudes aren't going up there in like the middle of the night and stuff. But uh, <laughs> well. But the next room over, it was like it was like. It was a boarding school, but it was definitely like a school for bad kids mm -hmm. too. But it was like, I don't know. It was cool. It was, it was awesome. I like totally like, I'm so grateful for the experience. But, um, so the hallway I was in, like the next room over, like I meet this kid, Scott, and he's this like t 
tiny kid with his pointy nose and just like buzz cut and I'm just like, what up? And like we became like best friends. And I was like, damn, dude, this kid's cool. And uh, so we're shredding together a bunch and then I'm like, damn, this kid's good. Like he's like hitting the gap jumps and like hitting all the rails and like, you know, like oversized jeans and just like dirty white hoodie, just like skate snowboard rat through and through. But it was him and um, this other kid, uh, Dave Irwin, I believe. So sick. Those two kids were like. Goofy foot. Was he goofy? Mm-hmm. Dude, he was like, I remember he was kind of like a Jamie Lynn type, like really squatty, like spin off the toes, like cab off the toes and stuff. And, um, But yeah, Scotty was like just so sick. And like I ended up actually getting kicked out of that school because I got caught smoking weed. <laughs> but I made it about three quarters of the way through the year. And like I w- had plans on going back, but like I just didn't, I just wanted to be home. Like I didn't, I didn't really like, I enjoyed the snowboarding aspect of it, but like, I just wanted like my old school friends back, you know? And, um, yeah, it was really interesting. There was like a landline there where you'd like call in and I'd always call in and check in on Scotty. And, uh, and I, sometimes I wouldn't be able to talk to him and I'd talk to somebody else. I'm like, yeah, what's up with Scotty? And he's like, oh dude, he's just like, Santa Cruz just gave him a board or like, I'd hear all these like rumblings (laughs) and be like, oh fuck, that's awesome. Maybe he'll make it. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until like I was tripped out when like M3 went down and I saw like the ad and it was like the lineup, you know, like Mikey LeBlanc, like Blaze Rosenthal and then like Scotty Whitlake. And I was like, hold up, like maybe this is a different Scotty. Is this the Scotty Whitlake? And I like looked and it was like fully him. And then Revival came out and I just lost my mind. I was like, damn, he did it. Like, <laughs> And how? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, and continued just to like do amazing stuff on a snowboard. So rad, you're like, that's my guy, that's my guy. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I didn't really talk to him much until like way later when I went to Mount Hood and I was just like, kind of, I'd see him around and I'd just be like, oh, he's, I, I've lost touch with him, but um, I was just like, oh, he's not gonna remember me or whatever. And then like finally, I was like at a party at, in Portland and I was like, yo, dude, you remember me? And he's like, Mike. He's like super stoked to see me and like he's always been so like kind and just an awesome dude. You remember go super air horn for Whitlake? The realist dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's so <laughs> rad. What a cool story. Man, that's so fun. So so then you're you're in high school and then at what point yeah, where'd you go from there? Yeah. So, I mean, I came back to Homer and finished out my high school there. And that's when I just like, just, I don't know, snowboarding really took off for me. Like it just, I just like kind of leveled up and, um, all my friends were like, what was it like? Like you made it out and snowboarded somewhere went, else. Every time you went anywhere and came back to Alaska, it was like that. Yeah. Like whoever left just had to do the full like cultural download. Yeah. <laughs> fully. <laughs> they were like, it was like getting code. And then bringing it back to the, the the mainframe, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was in the I was in the mix at like Squaw Valley at the time was like, it was a hub, you know, like Noah Selaznick and like just like the the hatchets and just like just that cultural hub. And so like, yeah, I just I def- definitely like downloaded to the to the homies and was like, this is this is what it was like and. Um, I knew I need I like wanted to get out of Alaska immediately as soon as I like graduated. So um I don't know, I was like uh once I graduated from high school, I got into school, um just like applied to a bunch of different schools throughout like the Northwest. I just wanted to stay close to home and um it just made the most sense. And I didn't really want to go to school, but I was kind of forced into it by my parents. They were like, This is what you're doing. Um, classic, like strict Asian parents, just like, you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor. This is what you're doing. (laughs) Were they, did they really put that sort of specific? No, not really. But it was definitely like in the back of my mind that like, they were like, you're destined to succeed. So it wasn't just (laughs) school. It was like school for greatness kind of. No, it was, I mean, I was kind of a, a fuck up kid. So just like they were they were just like just just do school like <laughs> yeah. just do something <laughs> that was like uh, the same for me you know? yeah 
and like we ended up in the same place i think for partially the same reasons yeah yeah it for felt sure like alaska you know for sure yeah it was like I, like no doubt like washington has like a lot of uh similarities to alaska so it's like you're dealing with like but with just like the like not as much harshness of just like the cold and just like the darkness like that's one thing like people don't realize is like in the thick of winter in alaska when when i was in high school or just school in general like you show up at like in the dark you know like 8 a.m or whatever you get out of school the sun's already gone down you basically like you might get like a little recess or some time off during the middle of the day to like get a little sunshine but it's like it's gnarly and like if you're not like acclimated to that or like have like systems in place to like deal with that it can be a pretty no pun intended dark place like for a lot of different reasons so like i knew i had to get out and like as soon as i had like got out i was just like it was um yeah like i ended up traveling a bunch when i was younger with my parents and like as soon as you leave and come back you're like oh like it's it's like this like there's actually like sunshine and like things that like in the winter that like you don't have in alaska and so um but yeah i ended up making it into um western washington university which is in bellingham washington and i gravitated towards that because i knew that there was snowboarding i, I knew about mount baker but i didn't really know like i didn't know what it was like culturally and like how insane it is for like snowboarding um it was a little bit on the back of my mind i was just like i just want to go somewhere where there's a good mountain and like i have some friends that's like feels kind of like home and so, the, that so, was the criteria yeah that's perfect my question is you guys both ak uh transplants when did you guys meet mount, mount hood yeah, yeah well yeah when he did my trick switch <laughs> that's when we met and i still got beef I actually did meet. You I, did a one up. Well, I, oh, big time one. I actually did. No, I I met you like ninety <laughs> eight at the Aldergrove Skate Park. Oh, but um, actually, I probably didn't meet you. I was probably too shy because like, Burner's a big deal. Oh, is he a big dog? He's a big dog. Yeah, yeah. Is but he? I remember you skating with Chris Bazalian. <laughs> yeah, because Bazalian lived in uh in um Bellingham and um. Dre actually came down and lived with him for a little bit too. Yeah. And uh, I would always skate with those guys. So I want to hear about this one up situation. So there's a, there's a guy just trying to get his front board on someone that's not very good at front boards, you know, not good at looking over the shoulder, kind of a blind Malmy slider type guy. Are you speaking in third person? I am now. Okay. I've switched into the <laughs> okay. third person. Okay. And I might never get out. <laughs> <laughs> help me. <laughs> so can you help me with this? <laughs> That's out of my pay range. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fix it in post. Yeah. Uh, I'm just like doing some cheesy little front boards on a mailbox. And it's and this, this steezy rider comes over, eyes it up, and drops its switch right in my face. Wow. Switch FB beat down right in your face. Yep. Was that, what was the move on that? Yosh? Well, for, for the record, I can't actually do like normal front boards. I can only do switch front boards. Mm -hmm. But so. I didn't know that. But now hearing <laughs> all this Whitlake stuff, Whitlake's kind of a switch mm -hmm. front boarder, you know? Yeah. Like it, try to think of a front board Whitlake's done like a normal one. Mm -hmm. I can think of one destroyer front board fakey on the Canyon rim rail. But yeah, I know what you mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also a I'm also a goofy foot skater mm. and regular foot snowboarder. Dude, same. Let's so. go. No, you're the other way. Yeah, you're, know, you're the opposite. Oh, no, no knocks. No knocks. Don't take that back. Uh, Retract. Can I take that back? Take that back. Take Edit that out. Edit that out. <laughs> McGruber would never remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Your regs on a your regs on a skateboard and goose goofy on a snowboard. On a snowboard. Yeah, Dude, yeah, Yoshi yeah. and I are on an alliance here. You're on yeah, the, you're, well, you're on an island. Okay, fine. We also <laughs> have like we got Ika Backstrom. We have a uh, UC yep. Oxenen. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have anyone except uh, Travis Rice. <laughs> <laughs> you know who else you got is uh i think you got sage kostenberg too oh wow oh wow, yeah, wow. wild card you know yeah uh, we got nicholas mueller we got uh there's more regular footers okay 
Yeah. Well, you got you got Jed Anderson too. Oh, I got Jed. That's a heavy one. That's actually maybe the. He's actually like a pro skater, so yeah, that's a nail in the coffin. So I don't know. It's kind of a big deal. I don't know. Which way does he fingerboard? Is the question. That kind of can change everything. Dude, everyone fingerboards regular. Yeah, that's true. The it great <laughs> equal. No, that's not true. Left-handers would fingerboard goofy. Yeah, that is. Yep. Yeah, we got to get to the bottom of this. We do. <laughs> Cancel everything. Hot topics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pause on your history, Yosh. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah, let's get to the bottom of this. This is fingerboard <laughs> discussion needs to be yeah. aired out right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you guys, you know, it's nice with the fingerboard. Big Mike. All right. Well, let's, I digress. Let's get back into it. Let's get back into it here. Uh, so then, so you you guys met. You you one upped initially. I just uh, established alpha male dominance right out of the gate. Well, I was. I mean, that was in my shred heyday. I was like, I wasn't trying to be a sponsored snowboarder, but I was. I was putting in some work. Mm. Um, riding Baker. All right, we are here to interrupt your programming to talk about all things bomb hole for a hot second. I got to tell you about our sticker pack. Now, this thing comes bursting at the seams. We're talking over 50 stickers per pack. And I don't know if you're like me. I'm a sticker nerd. I slap stickers on everything. You give me a water ball, boom, sticker. You give me a snowboard, I'm slapping stickers. I might take an hour on my sticker job. I love stickers. I'm sorry. But because of that, we wanted to make a sticker pack that was packed full of them. And it's only $15 for 50 stickers. And that's available at bombhole.com which we are currently in the process of making a destination website. So be sure to bookmark it. We've been uploading all types of new content from all over the internet, all the latest and greatest snowboard videos you can find on our editor's pick section, if you just scroll down a little bit. So check out bombhole.com for all your snowboard content needs. Uh, I recently, on Monday, uploaded a product review on the Capita Mercury. As of late, I've become a bit of a product nerd. Um, It's been really fun testing all the different boards, what I like about them. So many people ask me what Capita uh, they should get. So I figured I would just review the ones I ride and give my honest feedback. So you can find that at bombhole.com. Be sure to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts so you don't miss anything. And now back to your regular scheduled programming. Almost every day. Dude, I got a guest question that I think fits into this timeline here from none other than the Haas King. Patrick McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> what up, bomb hole listeners? Hello, Gren Diesel and the bomb hole. How the hell are we doing? Heard Yoshida's coming into the booth today. I wanted to ask, where does your passion for cooking come from? I know when we first met, you were the cook, the line cook for the ski patrol at Mount Baker. And you've always been able to make some of the most amazing meals. So one, what is the first meal? What is your go-to meal to cook? And uh, where did this passion stem from? All right. Um, Dude, thanks, McCarthy. Love that guy. He's the best. Um, Yeah, I mean, cooking has always been something that I've, for some weird reason, had a passion for. And it's like, I think I got a lot of that actually from my mom, who's like an amazing cook and she cooks like insane Japanese food. So um, kind of learning to cook under her wing, I was always interested in like learning how to cook Japanese food. Um, and then as as far as like the Mount Baker thing, like when I, <clears throat> so I, I'll get into like, I made it to college, right? And I just didn't want to be there. Like I was like, basically like failed out within the first like three quarters because I just didn't want to be there and I didn't know I just wasn't taking classes that I wanted and wasn't interested and um so I got out of there and then um eventually uh eventually went back to community college and got my A degree that was like the band-aid to be like get my parents off my back and um and then I was like yeah I'm I'm gonna do my own thing and I, the only way I I'd I really fell in love with snowboarding and like kind of fell out of it because of, I just didn't have enough money to do it. But, um, it's hard to get that ride from Bellingham sometimes too. Yeah. I didn't have a car. So it's like, if you don't have the homie who's just putting in that, who's got the car and is down for sure. For sure. And like, so I got like way into skateboarding. That was just like, I mean, we like, and it was pretty rough. Like Bellingham doesn't, didn't have much, they didn't have a skate park. They didn't have the the Bellingham skate park was like, 
a curb that was put up on two cinder blocks that was like at the bottom of high street in like an abandoned parking lot. And that's what we used to call the Bellingham skate park. So, but, um, I'm really rambling and taking the long story here, but, uh, so yeah, eventually like I fell back in love with snowboarding because I got, I started living with some skaters that, that snowboarded and they had, they had a car. Like my buddy, Kevin Foss was like down to like drive me to the mountain. And, um, yeah, he gave me a hand-me-down board and I had like some crappy outerwear and I would just like ride up with him. Was it that camo outerwear? No, <laughs> no, this is way, way before. Oh, was it the Coors goggles? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not the Coors strap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just had some crappy outerwear or whatever, but um, but yeah, we like... Hey, I can get you a deal on outerwear, man. Yeah, if you can give me a pro form, I'm really <laughs> hey, looking dude, for I, some I new goggles. You yeah, you know, the pad actually you can... Yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I started riding Baker again and like, I got to, sorry how it's, but like I straight up just poached tickets. I couldn't afford it. Um, I would just sneak on the lift and Whoa. and ride as much as possible. Allegedly, we should say for Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah, they might yeah. actually yeah. still come at you for yeah, that Yeah, I actually, <laughs> I, I might be fucked, but I got to be honest. <laughs> and then uh, what's even more fucked is uh, um, I had a buddy who worked the ticket window and used to sell me the five dollar child ticket <laughs> that's kind of oh, that's allegedly kind of, at least i'm still paying money for yeah something. that's, that's yeah true. um but uh anyhow yeah that's how i really got back into snowboarding because there was a period of time just like between alaska and moving to washington and getting established that i i couldn't do, afford to do it so skateboarding was the way but um after that, I realized I'd got, got like kind of, you know, built a community at Baker a little bit, had some friends and, and I uh, realized they're like, what's, what's the best way for me to like get a season pass? I'm like really bummed on like having to poach and just like being all sketchy. And they're like, you should get a job there. It can kind of put you in touch with some people. And so uh, I ended up getting, once I graduated from community college, I ended up getting a job cooking and that like, I mean, long story or long, long, um, answer to that story. Sorry, Pat. But, um, <laughs> I mean, that was like what refueled my, um, my passion for cooking is getting into that kitchen. So what exactly was your job? It said line, he said line cook for the ski patrol. Well, I, I first started. So the first year I started was 99, 2000 year, I think world record. No, that 98, 99. Oh, and that. <laughs> That year, that was the year that I was going up a lot. <laughs> and then I was just like, why wouldn't I want to work at Mount Baker after they just had the best season ever? Um, world record snowfall. So, um, yeah, I got a job as uh, just flipping burgers at White Salmon. Mm. And um, I got to tell you, like, if, if, if anybody's out there looking for a job, like, at the ski area, if you're a young kid, just, like, that you need a season pass or whatever, like, the cook job is the way to go because I befriended the uh, manager. We, we got on good terms and we just had it set up. He's like, why don't you just cut like you like snowboarding? Why don't you just like have the mornings off and then you can come in around like 10 o'clock and like pretty much from like, you know, nine to 11 or eight to 11 or whatever. It's like first tracks are done and then you just go to work. So you get a lot of riding time and like not to not like not to dog on um lift ops or anything, but like they kind of get the shaft a little bit. But um, it's like the slime line of jobs at the A little bit. Are. I mean, you gotta get in where you fit in. There's not always those kitchen jobs. So but um but yeah, I was just flipping burgers for the first year and um dude, it was so sick. Like some of the people I would run across, like some of the like ledge legendary people that I got to cook burgers for were so sick. I remember like cooking burgers for Noah Slaznik when he was like on his way out, like kind of, he was riding an ML, MLY board at the time. Oh wow. Like I was paying attention to all this stuff. Like, what you know, kind of burger did he want? Do you want a quad stack? I think he, yeah, did he stack it up? <laughs> I gave him the quad stack. Yeah. <laughs> wrapped it in the normal hamburger wrapper. So you give him the discount and you're like, here you go, dude. Quad stack. <laughs> no, I don't know. Probably like a chicken burger or something. Some crinkle cut fries with some some super cut. spines on them. <laughs> 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 yeah for sure but yeah that was like a highlight just like just 
being like a little close to that culture and just like, cause like it wasn't necessarily like the big dogs coming through. You wouldn't see like JP or Jeremy or like the really highly progressive guys. It was more of like the older guys who were like, you'd see like Andy Hetzel or like, you know, a Noah or, um, yeah, all those, all those old heads coming through. It was really sick. Um, but the next year, I did you have anything to do with the brownies? Cause I ate a lot of the brownies. No, <laughs> there was a baker that did all the baking. Okay. I was straight. What about the burgers. bread bowls? I would make some occasional bread bowls, like a salmon chowder bread bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> Let's just go in and eat, get a salmon chowder bread bowl. <laughs> Lang, we're trying to shoot. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got to love the John Lang salmon chowder bread bowl, man. I love that guy. <laughs> um, yeah, so just strictly, it was strictly like burgers, nachos, and, and bread bowls. Um, but, yeah, the, the next year I found out there's this other job. This is the epic job, and this is the job that not too many people get to do. But it's the employee cook job. And so that's the job where basically like at the very top of the mountain, it's Heather Meadows Lodge. And there's basically like a hotel up there where all the employees live. And there's a cook who will cook breakfast, like s- serve like a sack lunch, like a packable lunch, and then you cook dinner. And it's like the most epic job because talk about like you get time off. You're working from four to like seven. You're cooking breakfast for everyone. You're grinding. But then you have from about eight to two like a huge window of just like shredding. And that's, then that's the window. That's the window. That's, <laughs> yeah, the, window. that's yeah, the whole like, day. That's the whole day. Yeah, pretty much. Like the lifts close around three. So like that's pretty much like you're shredding all day. And then you come back, you cook from like three and you're done around eight. So it's like a split shift. But um but yeah, that's when I really got to hone the skills for cooking because you get like you're cooking all sorts of different meals, like and 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 um, you get to customize things and like, I don't know, it's kind of an interesting job because you hold a lot of power. Like um, there's like all these employees that you, you're responsible for, you know? So, um, and the, the split shift or the shift is three and a half days on, three and a half days off. So, I mean, you get to snowboard every single day for a long time if you want to. And I definitely took advantage of every single like first track hiking into like midway mid station at chair one, just like got a lot of first chairs. Like, and it <laughs> so was, sick. it wasn't even about like filming or like, it was just about getting it with your homies. And just like, we just had like, I mean, writing at Baker, you'd kind of have to have an agenda of like, all right, like this filled in, you know, you can, you, you hit this, you, you have your sequence, like, Oh, I'm going to hit gun sites first because like, it's going to be untracked. Yeah. And be, then you, be careful what you say on air here. You might get, locals might be out, out for blood if you give away too much. Yeah, intel. you might have already crossed the line, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a pretty obvious one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Okay, I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> no, but like you get chair six right under the chair, first track. Yeah. You are heliboarding. Essentially, yeah. It's so freaking good, dude. Yeah. And if you're in that position, you that's probably happened to you once a week. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes three, four times a week. And you, like, the thing about riding a mountain that much um, just consecutively is you, like, you understand every single little piece of that mountain and, like, every little roll and, like, every single piece of terrain to where, like, you can get so dialed in and honed in that you you can just send stuff without even, like, looking at it. And um, and you wrote it the day before, and you wrote it yeah, the day before mm-hmm, that. Exactly. So, Exactly. You can so, even like, see a ghost of your previous track or whatever. And yeah. I'm going to land on the backside of my previous track that now yeah. has another eight inches of snow. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I definitely, like, honed the skills and then, you know, Mount Hood happened and you're just, next thing you know, you're, like, 200-plus days on snow. And then you're out there looking like Yosh Frankie on Toya out there, basically. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but, like... And then at some point in here, you just discovered a hostile blood in a dusty attic. Hey, b- before, before, <laughs> before we get into that, we got to hit a segment of the show right now called Run Through a Wall Trivia. Welcome to Run Through a Wall Trivia. Your, 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 your 
fire. Here's how we're going to do run through wall trivia. So what the deal is here is, uh, Bertner, you're going to count them down. So we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got about ten questions, maybe eleven. Wait, do I have to do these two? Uh, if you want, you don't. You don't no. have to. It's more mainly for Yosh. If Yosh gets it wrong, he's got to do a smelling salt. I want to do it. And so if he gets it, if he gets it right, you can do one. Oh, we're like competing. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That, that, that if you want to do one, I mean, you can do. Why don't you hit one right now? Because yeah, I need to. You get no up. sense of smell, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it's back. It's back. <laughs> yeah, it's back. Wait, I, I forgot. You that. just pinch it, like that. Yeah. And, and it'll just, break. It'll break, and it'll turn red. And then you squeeze put, it. Put it in your eye. Well, you can do that. It's not recommended. <laughs> we do not recommend to try that at home. You can make your own choices, though. What do I do with pinch, my hands? So just pinch it. Okay. There you go. Oh, oh you went in. You went in. <laughs> All right, so Yosh, I appreciate that. I think you say that to everyone, though. No, no, that like I, I that, like ease dude, it up. You went in. I'm feeling like you Lando are. now, <laughs> <laughs> dude. You got to be careful with these things. This, this is like it can be a day ruiner if you don't do it. Like, N- really? No, it's I, not. I, it's a day ruiner. It's, it's, it's like a little point. bit of wasabi. It, it is. is. Right, Let's right, we'll give it a shot. Here we go. First question. And you count it down at like five, four, three, two, one. And if he wants, if he doesn't answer in five seconds, I buzzer him. So oh, here we go. nice! I get to add pressure to you it. You get to add pressure, so it's it's a clutch situation. Okay. First question: Homer, Alaska, is the capital of the world for what type of fishing? Halibut. Oh, shizzle! And he's good. Booyah! He's good. He might be the best. He's good. With my help, he <laughs> could be the best. <laughs> Ace Ventura, the guy in the totem pole. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The focal length of the lens is called what on a camera? Five. Focal length. Four. The focal length of the lens. Three. Zoom? Two. That's the F-stop. <laughs> focal F- F- F-stop is the focal length of the lens. Yosh, you dropped your F-stop, bro. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, we Baby got one. Ball. Here we go. Oh, I haven't seen ne- that baby mole face in a while. <laughs> next next question. What movie does Steve Carell refer to a body part as bags of sand? <laughs> Five. Four year old version. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what, what, what musician with four Grammys is originally from Homer, Alaska? Jewel. Oh, sh- damn it. <laughs> He's good. Who has a better switch frontside 360? Mike Yoshida or Devin Walsh? Five. Devin Walsh. Far wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you should have saw that one. Okay, this is, a, this is an important one. What are the letters and numbers of the license plate in McGruber that he's trying to remember? <laughs> oh, shit. These five, four, K. Five, three. KBR five nine six. It's close. It's KFBR three nine two. All right, he's, <laughs> he's rolling good. You now. need a couple more down there. More. Okay, more. here there. Yeah, there you go. Okay, next question. What drink does Vicky order dressed up as McGruber in the movie McGruber? That's the Tazo iced tea. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm gonna hit one for that. <laughs> Woo! I'm all no no no. Take, take, the, take the tip back. <laughs> McGruber would never order that. I'm all about the large Tazo tea. Okay. Take the, sorry. Take the tip back. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. I'm not so actually sorry. Okay. What is the name of the villain McGruber is after? That would be cunt. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. And I, I did this one because I don't think you'll get it, and I wasn't sure this is skunk insurance. So what is the maximum F-stop? Five. Well, it varies. Four. 32? Three. 45. There's an F-45. Okay. <laughs> so hit it. My lens is 32. Yep. Wow. Nice work, yo. <laughs> nice work. Michael, great job. I'm all about the large They, they kind of get cold. Do you they? know um, Zim went or, heli or went to Baldface with McGruber last year? No. Oh <laughs> yeah. <my> Actual <laughs> McGruber? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> that is insane. Yeah. Damn. So. Ask Dude, I still that. don't know about that focal length thing. You know what? The F-stop stuff I consulted Clavin on. Okay. So you can take it up with him. And and he will. Yes. Okay. He's uh, He is known for a blurry photo or two, though. So I don't <laughs> know. His F-stop's. Whack. Speaking of F stop, uh, when when did you pick up the old uh, camera? Um, 
Wow. That those blasted me. Sorry. You're good. <laughs> there you go. One more. <laughs> yeah. He's Oh yeah. He's ready to go. I yeah. haven't hit one yet. Let me get in there. Yeah, get in there. Oh, oh, oh god. That was a good one. <laughs> Woo! All right, we're back. We're back in action. Oh god. <laughs> oh yeah, crazy. Eyes. Uh okay. so I picked up a camera um late 90 i think like maybe 97 98 or something i got in a pre- i got a pretty bad ankle injury skateboarding and um and yeah i was just laid up i was on crutches for a couple months um and then randomly my dad just mailed me a camera he just like cuz he he knew i was interested but he sent me an actual like slr that he he like had and didn't use anymore and so yeah i started using that camera and um my roommates at the time were like into shooting photos and i was just kind of like following their lead and i was like damn this is like pretty pretty fun and like washington and bellingham in particular it's like a very beautiful area and like there's just like endless things to take photos of um so i wasn't necessarily like jumping in like shooting action photos or anything but that's like when I first got my start, just like messing with a camera and just like, yeah. And I mean, later on, it's just like, that's just when I, when I started working at Baker, I still had a camera and I just knew like, you know, why not just marry the two things that I love the most, like snowboarding and photography and like didn't really take it seriously as like, I'm going to become a pro snowboard photographer. Like I want this to be my profession, but I was like, got interested and was like why not just like start trying it so that's killer uh you know uh silk i think we got some patreon questions uh the one from thomas portet you want to cue that one up that's a solid yeah this might apply to both you guys too because you guys yeah kind of a free-for-all out here sick (laughs) what are your photography tricks to deal with the typical flat lighting of the pacific northwest yeah thomas great question um well with flat light and especially stormy weather, you want to kind of um, pick the terrain that has a lot of trees. Um, trees just help with definition and um, also like gives you a good spot to kind of hunker down and get away from weather if if that is out there. Um, yeah, you want to you want to pick terrain that's kind of got a little bit of depth and some contrast to it. I don't know. Do you want to add to that, Jesse? Well, I mean, when we first started <laughs> shooting pretty early, it was definitely uh, air blaster that was helping with that. Yeah. (laughs) Because I was wearing an all yellow suit head to toe. (laughs) Yeah. We'd go out on like the worst day and you're just illuminating the whole thing Mm -hmm. Yeah, with your gear. So there is something to be said for what you wear, what the rider wears, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, there's also like, depending on how you want how fancy you want to get, you know, you can bring some, a little bit of flash work to the program and, um, Yeah. I mean, it's, it gets pretty heavy and a little like, um, strenuous, but like, yeah, that's another way is to just add a flash and, um, get a little bit of depth going. I feel like you leaned into it a lot too. Like we would shoot a lot of like with the medium format camera and stuff Mm -hmm. and like, uh, that just sort of like that type of film really leans into that stormy Northwest vibe, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like early days, it was a lot of black and white photography and like, you know, like, um, Chris Brunkhart was a huge inspiration for me. And like, he was like the guy, the predecessor that was at Baker, like really doing it and like having just a really cool eye. But, um, but yeah, also like with the black and white film photography, you had the option of like, you can get in the dark room and you can use a lot of like tricks as far as like dodging and burning that you do use now in Photoshop. So it's like, um, that's another way to really like bring things out. Do you feel like when you grew up shooting on film, it helped you hone your skills when everything switched over to digital? Like you had an advantage with that? I wouldn't say, I don't know. I don't think I really had an advantage. I was kind of fighting it. Like, um, I don't know. I was just, I I wasn't like that deep into film before I switched switched to digital, but I had like, you know, a handful of years where it was like, I was getting quite a bit of stuff published on film and it was just, it was just nice because you didn't really have to, um, you didn't have to process your images and work on that stuff. It was more of just like, um, 
you shoot, you get what you get. You either nail it or you don't. Um, you can't really like tinker with stuff too much. You can do, you can do that in the dark room, but not really like slide films, like pretty finicky, you know, you kind of got to nail it. So, um, but moving on to digital, there was a lot of, lot to learn as far as like processes of like staying organized in computer work and processing. Um, and I didn't really understand, um, processing when I first switched to digital, I was kind of a purist. I was like, well, if you shoot film, color slide film, and you're not messing with the shot in Photoshop, you just send them the slide and that's as is, that's how you should like treat your digital file. So I would like probably didn't get run a lot when I switched over to digital. Cause I was just sending them a flat raw file, like not processed, you know, I was like, well, that's cheating if you're like doctoring your stuff up. But like, um, yeah, it was not until like later when I took like the course that Dano and Zim put together for like, um, for future snowboarding where they like taught us Lightroom. They had like a conference in Whistler and they were just like, we needed, we need to teach these fools what's up, you know? So like they taught us like Lightroom and processing. Zim's still trying to teach me Lightroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking right into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it was like, Thank goodness those guys came along. I mean, there's just like so much to like figure out. Um, and like even shooting film too, like I didn't really have like a mentor or anybody to like look up to. I was kind of on an island. And like back then, I think um, a lot of photographers like kind of like hold their like cards to the chest pretty, pretty hardcore. It's not like it is now. Um, Cause I mean, essentially now you can kind of like YouTube and figure out a lot of stuff and like, through trial and error, you can like become a decent photographer in like a pretty short amount of time. So it was just a little different back then. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Bub's Naturals. They are a supporter of the show and they've got a great new product that just came out called Hydrate or Die. It's an electrolyte mix. It's a little bit of powder. You pour it in your drink, mix it up, keeps you hydrated. Now, Bub's Naturals Hydrate or Die electrolyte mix is here to help you hydrate fast and recover quickly with no added sugars. Hydrate or Die has 2,000 milligrams of powerful electrolytes from nature, not a lab. So uh, there's no added sugars. This is this is good for you, and it keeps you hydrated. And as you get older, you end up getting dehydrated. You chug coffee all day, and then uh, you got to get the hydration back in the system. What about you, Yosha? I heard you're on some bubs these days. Yeah, I've actually had some of the Hydrate or Die um, when I was at Peace Park. Uh, Mike Hatchett had some in his bag and he handed yeah a little shout out he handed me some of these like a big bag of them i think the same size and uh, i started putting it in my water every day and I, it really did keep me hydrated it's good stuff it's good stuff i can't recommend it enough and it's not like some bs i use this stuff every single day uh it's it's really good so if you're interested in picking up some bubs naturals hydrator dye head on over to their website bubsnaturals.com use promo code bombhole for 20 percent off your first order all right. So earlier you briefly mentioned uh, talking about going to Mount Hood. Uh, where, yeah, what what happened the summer you spent up at Hood? Tell us about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it was um, I want to say like o two o three winter maybe o three tundra with a sled in the back. Or sorry, continue. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty Arnold lyric. <laughs> <That's the OTT>. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the bun, or? <laughs> that one didn't age well. We'll keep that one moving. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, yeah, so I was, uh, I had gotten the, um, I think at the time I had gotten the employee cook job, and I was just all in on boarding. I just wanted to board as much as possible. I knew, like, Mount Hood was always, like, a big ticket item that, like, I wanted to go when I was a kid, but, like, it was just never in the cards. Um, and so you know, the next best thing is just to work there as an adult. And then you kind of get to reap the benefits of all that comes with snowboard camp. But, um, so yeah, I got through some connections. I got, um, clued into, um, Jason Leroy, who was the, um, the kitchen manager. And we just had high cascade or wind else. This is a high cascade. Huh. Respect. Yeah. Respect. And, uh, yeah, we just hit it off and he was just like, he knew I had some cooking experience. So, he was just like, yeah, come down early. Like, we'll all, you can come down like pre-camp and like cook for like a couple of employees and some of the diggers, and then like we'll just roll that into camp. And um, yeah, it was 
it was epic, man. I mean, like, as you know, like a lot of people talked about it in this seat that like, um, Mount hood was the spark to like a ton of careers and, um, and high cascade in particular for me was like huge. Um, it's where I met Jesse. I met like tons of pros. I was like, doing my tricks. Where you want to do where you want up. That's where I first one-upped Jesse. That's when I first, first, one-upped. <laughs> That's when I first, first one-upped. of many one ups <laughs> on him. But you know, it's just like, you're immediately plugged into the scene. You know, you, it's just like, you get to meet so many connections and pro snowboarders and Amon, Amon stamps. What up? What up? Um, uh, what up, Yosh? Yeah. <laughs> Is that where that comes from? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Did not, I never yeah. knew the reference. Yeah. What up, Yosh? <laughs> um, Do you see yeah. any oppo out shit there? <laughs> Anyone doing any oppo yeah, out? Yeah, Danny. <laughs> um, anyhow, I was like, yeah, it's like such an amazing place to just be connected and, and also just to snowboard. I wasn't there for the connections that came like after the fact, but I was there for the boarding. And, um, Yeah, Mount Baker at the time had, like, they were kind of heavily investing into snowboard parks, and they had their own park for probably two or three seasons. But um, So, yeah, I was getting into riding park and, like, doing tricks and, like, just wanted to, like, push myself as far as I could. So, um, so yeah, I ended up at High Cascade um, K-Unit. K-Unit! K-Unit! Same same scene. I, like, befriended the the kitchen manager. And, um, I was like, yeah, I kind of like to shred a lot. And he's like, well, just come and cook lunch then. And then you can have the mornings off and you get to shred the best time. So then I'm like linking up Baker to Mount hood, um, high cask Baker to high cascade. And then just like shredding my face off, like just pretty much like, wasn't really like a shredder at high cascade that was teaming up with anybody. I was like headphones on and just like, I'm going to hit this jump by myself or like, it's kind of like a little bit of an outsider, but it was like like M M&M. and M, yeah, Mom spaghetti, Mom spaghetti, vomit on my oh, t-shirt sure. already. For What's sure. in the headphones? What are we talking? I don't even remember back then. Probably just whatever, like probably some like electro pop because mm. that was like super. In. Not a little like, a kind of young G. <laughs> <laughs> I was like bone crusher that summer, you know, like. Mm. Well, I remember just seeing like Jesse from a distance on the big jump, just like damn, dude, bone this guy's. Cap He'd nine? be doing like. Double line, he'd be doing like switch stale fish to cab nine. Woo. It was big into the switch straight the air, switch, so yeah. it was dope. And um, yeah, and watching Whitlake, um, Whit, like a bunch of people hitting that. That's when High Cascade really had a decent big jump mm-hmm. where it was like, it was intimidating. You had to show up. You had to kind of, ex- yeah. yeah, or check out one of those two. Yeah. Is it go big or go home? If you didn't go big, you had to just go home. Situation. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was yeah. That was the probably the era of like you had to take the camp photo at the end of camp at the end of the session on the big jump, and all the campers were on the knuckle. Were, <laughs> yeah. were you ever that guy, Jesse? Well, by the time I was actually had the signature session, I was like, hell no, am I doing that? <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna hippie hop a camper. <laughs> Everyone get together, you. I'm gonna hippie hop you, yeah. and that's the photo we're getting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Legendary. So we're at that point, that's pre camera in hand, right? You're just mom spaghetti, switch front three. Uh no, I, that was a camera in hand. Oh, camera in but hand I was, scenario. I was just like just dabbling with the idea of like huh, this might be fun to like shoot snowboarding just as like a fun thing, not just a just a hobby, you know? And I did actually like a couple times I did like start to bring the camera out just to shoot like the homies in the K unit or whatever, you know, like not really trying to like maybe Genovese. Mm. You know, I was probably pointing my cam at Genovese. Good style, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, yeah. So, so my question is, I, I mean, well, before we get into the Think Tank era, which I can't wait to sink our teeth into that, <laughs> uh, what was the first published photo you ever had in a magazine? I think. Um, First published photo was just like a scenic photo in Frequency, which is now the Snowboarder's Journal. Um, I had like a contents page or something because uh, they're based out of Bellingham. So that was like my first in. I was like, damn, there's like a mag based in the town I'd like live in. I'm going to find these guys and like hunt them down. And um, I don't know how I found the office but yeah i my first submission was straight up just like manila, manila envelope just stuffed under the door and just like probably run away 
Like, not even <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I think I had maybe met Jeff Galbraith um, a handful of times, but like nothing to the point where I was on their radar as far as like being an up comer or anything. So, Hey, Silk, we got a, a Patreon we could serve up from Lance Hacker. Yeah. Lance is asking, when Yosh first came up, He'd scored a few covers in a pretty short period, if I remember correctly. What, in your opinion, is the equivalent to landing covers that can significantly affect the potential for a successful career these days? Hmm. Well, I'll be honest, getting on the bomb hole. (laughs) I mean, straight up, like, if you're looking at the equivalent of, like, I mean, covers back in the day, like, meant a lot. And granted, there were a lot of them more of them than there is now but um you made an impact there was no instagram there was no um everyone was holding on to their cards and they would come out like slowly so when you got a hold of any type of media it really meant something and it was like made an impact and you got a little insight of like what that person was doing that past year that whole past year because now it's just real time and you're like you can see like what Joe Schmo pro snowboarder ate for yeah. breakfast. You try to tell someone what you're up to. They're like, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I went over the, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we saw it on the gram. Yeah. yeah. I already know all the tricks you did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you ordered the breakfast sandwich with the bacon. So it's all yeah. good. But yeah. So it's, you know, it's just a different time in a different world. But like back then it was like, you really held on to stuff and you saved it. And when it came out, it meant a lot more. It just had more of an impact, I guess, in a different way. So, but I think, in this day and age, it's like, it's true. I think the bomb hole has a lot of impact. Um, and I don't know, you ask any team rider, or team manager, person in a brand, like, would you rather have your top pro have a bomb hole or a cover of a mag? I don't know. Like, But from the hard photographer's topic. standpoint, where does your photo live? Yeah, where, that's, yeah. Oh, where, sorry. Where does With the f- digital landscape yeah, where versus d- a print landscape, it's like, if you got the phone, which you really never soak in the photo, like it seems like like video has survived because it just goes to YouTube instead of DVDs and people still see it and they still see it on their phones. But like photos are the thing that suffered with the change in the digital landscape the most to me. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of like, that's a tough one. It's hard to get eyes on your photos and, um, and it's definitely diluted. So, um, I mean, that's like, really like what um motivated me to like start doing my own self-published work because you know it's completely controlled in my environment and like that's kind of like what i always wanted all along and like you know you even when mags were popping it's like you have an article come out and even when i worked at the mag i had like control of the layout and everything but like at the end of the day like to have full total control like what's going to go on the cover like what's going to be on the inside how is like how's the cadence and the flow going to be that was like i think that's kind of like a good direction for people to go and you're definitely not going to get the eyeballs on it. like as many as like getting like i don't know like 5000 copies flooded throughout the distribution but like you're going to have something personalized to you that's going to make an impact and i think that's like a fun route to go and like definitely like something a lot of other photographers should lean into. I see a trend too with a lot of photographers like yourself. You got a MikeYoshida.com print store where you have your zines and you have your prints. And uh, I see a lot of other photographers doing the same. And so it seems like a lot of photographers are taking matters into their own hands and being like, I'm just going to sell prints on my site. Right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you you are, I mean, it's it's happened across the board. You've like even like a pro snowboarder, you kind of like are curating your own brand. You are your own brand and it's like what you want to make of it really. Like I don't really promote my prints and zines as much as I probably should if I really wanted to like lean into and sell them, but like they there it's there if people like want it, you know, and like and um yeah, I see the sales trickle in and that just stokes me out, you know. Um but yeah, I think like definitely like taking the matters into your own hands and like just creating your own brand and like who knows like where you can take it there's a, there's a lot i mean i'm just scratching the surface there's like so much more you could do with it mm-hmm. and then for the brands themselves too it's like the brands had to become the mags riders had to become brands brands had to become media sources right so for like mervin like what we do it's like the equivalent of a single page or a two page spread or a cover even is like 
okay, what's the photo we're going to use to launch this particular campaign? And this one photo is going to appear across all these places. It's going to be, you know, a slider on the website. It's going to be the lead off Instagram. It's going to be in the email, email blast. It's going to be a window option for a store. It's going to be in a magazine as a two page spread. Mm. And that's like kind of the, where we've landed as like the, how do we celebrate a great image? Well, as from a brand standpoint, that's how we're doing it. Like you try to find like that image that maybe would have been a cover and, and elevate it however you can digitally, you know? Mm, that's so cool. Well, it seems like also, too, in the heyday, like you you guys had way more opportunities to sell ads, too. Yeah, like for sure. Writers. For like sure. The magazines were like the place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's like, it's been replaced with Instagram, and essentially, you know, that's where the photos are going. But yeah, there was a lot more opportunities, and there was a lot more magazines, and not not just the ones in America. It was international. So like... If you got a great image, granted, if it wasn't a cover, you could sell it multiple places. I mean, you name it, Europe, Japan, Australia. Um, yeah, and, and pre-Instagram, it wasn't like blasted everywhere. So where they wouldn't even, these markets wouldn't even like cross. They, you wouldn't even, no one would even see each other's mags. So like nobody cared. And, it, and within Europe, it was like very regional. There was like Germany, France. You know, like you could even like, if you're really hustling, you could really like clean up mm -hmm. on certain imagery. Yeah, you could take you could take a photo, or it seems like you could go to a shoot. Maybe you get two images of a rider. One of them you sell to an ad, like as an ad to a fucking DVS or some brand for like five, eight, ten grand, right? And then you send the rest to the to the Euro mags, and then they they all publish them. And then yeah, it seems like you just it, it was a lot easier. Like uh, the the photo of the rider a good one had a lot more value than it does today. Yeah, definitely. And it was like, for a writer, it was like, you knew where you had to make an impact. It, it was, there were a lot more magazines, but it was just magazines and videos on hard copy. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually a smaller pool. Yep. And so you're like, what do we got to do? Like as a brand or a writer, like we got to look good in snowboarder. We got to look good in trans world. We got to look good in snowboard mag. We got to look good in these international mags, you know, and show... Can we show up in MacDog? You know, you're just focused on like that. Um, and now it's like, what do you got to do? You got to do everything, dude. You got to be everywhere, be everything for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit more confusing. Mm -hmm. These modern times. Yeah, it seems like like a photographer, instead of selling a single photo to a, uh, to a, to a magazine or a brand, you don't sell a single photo. You basically are like a Dropbox with like, some lifestyle photos, like a whole a whole campaign of photos for X amount of dollars instead of a single image. Yeah. Oh, well, for sure. I mean, brand-wise, too, I've seen a lot of that. Like, um, And, um, yeah, I mean, just, like, breaking stuff out into, like, what's, what's the value? Like, what are you trying to sell? And then, like, commodifying that and then, like, approaching the brand and then being, like, what platform do you want to run this on? Probably Instagram. So like making sure everything's cropped correctly for that and then approaching them being like, well, let's just do a package deal. You know, it's just kind of how the evolution of it is going. And like, yeah, that's just, that's just is how it is. Well, let me ask you this. Has the, has the iPhone slightly made the big camera a little bit less relevant because it's so damn good? Um, I don't think so. I think there's still things that, um, you can, that are just like proprietary for like a big dog camera that you can't quite do with an iPhone yet. Um, timing too. It's not like super fast. Um, and if you want to get like technical with it, like you can't really add lighting. Well, I mean, you can add like hot lights or something, but like who's really doing that right now? I mean, maybe that's something for the future, but maybe more for video. Yeah, More true. for video, Good for point. sure, for sure. And because like, the yeah. look, the user-generated content look is more sought after for video than photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that's a good point. So, all right, uh, we kind of got into the weeds for a second there. That was great. But then, uh, so you talked about Hood. Um, and then at what point, I mean, maybe we're going on a chronological, but let's sink our teeth into the Think Tank era. What time did you guys cross, cross streams? Well, I mean, we... <laughs> 
I think it was maybe McCarthy that really set it up. The Thunk? first yeah. shoot. But it was it would have been cue the birds okay. year. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And um yeah, we just started going out at Baker and there was this one mute stiffy that never got <laughs> ran that I'm still looking for. Mike? Mute Stiffy? Like uh, it got it. it got messed up in processing, Jesse. <laughs> I'm sorry. Those are the film days and <laughs> just really No, like Sir Think Tank, I mean, I had a couple fringe things in in Thunk that um like when Jeno jibbed the car with the Mohawk. Oh right. You weren't there. No, I wasn't. But that just kinda happened and I was like I think I was working at Baker at the time and I was just like in the back lot with the camera, just like I guess I'll shoot photos of this. And like those ended up getting published. So maybe that was like my first fake think tank shoot, but um, but yeah, I remember we were at the trade show. Well, no, we were like, what was it? Yeah, McCarthy was like, kind of latched onto me at High Cascade. My second year, I had come back to work the photo department, so we were shooting photos of the campers and stuff, and um, and McCarthy just we just hit it off, man. He was just a riot. I mean, he still is, and he's just like one of the most genuine best humans I know. Um, love that guy. And he basically just took me under his wing and he was like, next year we're going to shoot. You live in Bellingham. We're going to shoot at Baker. And, um, I was kind of like, just brushed it off. Like, yeah, whatever. Like we'll see. And like, sure enough, like he's calling me like nonstop and we're starting to get some imagery going. And I remember like being, being at, Pat's first condo that he bought and I had like a slide sheet of stuff and like Bertner and Lang were, were all like linking up to go shoot and 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 um I had my slides with me and Jesse was looking at him being like yep that one's an ad just like validating like these are good cool <laughs> kind of like a little sign off and then like from then on it was just um I think it was when we went to Tahoe that was probably our first big trip. We went yeah. out at Baker a couple times. Yeah. So there oh, was that's that right. dog we did. with the blown out knees. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, we did. So we did go out at Baker. With Gus. Yeah. yeah. But I still wasn't, I wasn't sure. I was like, I don't know if Jesse likes me, like whatever. Like I was kind of a little intimidated by Jesse back then because well, I had like, like given up on photos to a certain extent. I had a few guys that I worked with that were great, but there, it wasn't, I really committed to video, like in a way that was like, you know what? A photo, it's hard to get in a magazine. It's either going to happen or it's not. Let's get the clips. I don't care about the photo, you know, like. Well, and, and to, to provide a little bit of context, like photographers want you to go hit the road gap and like get a big iconic image. And, and at that point, the direction Think Tank was going was a lot of like, you know, there's, there's hippie hops and things that a, that a, a gen, general tenured photographers maybe not their favorite thing to shoot too right? yeah and this was even pre hippie hops though yeah oh it is okay yeah we're just pretty much chucking off kickers oh yeah kick you the birds era is that we're yeah talking? yeah you guys yeah still chuck and roast yeah, yeah so it was i think it was just we were in between photogs like jimmy clark had moved on and josh thompson was our kind of go-to photog uh airhorn thompson <laughs> but um and we were just sort of you know, for whatever reason, at that moment, we were photographer less and uh, and Yosh came in and it was like he had the eye from the very beginning, you know, like it was I think it, like hearing your story now firsthand from you, it's like you could see the skate influence coming through, like that you were taking these like singular images, like a lot of other guys had come up in the sequence era and they hadn't switched a brain over really they. It was like, no, just the one thing that like works, like that one, you just need the one dope frame and it has a lot to do with vibe. And it was like, you had that, you know, where it was like, oh, this guy's going to make us look, he, he's going to capture the scene, you know, like he's not going to just, we're not just trying to get, why would we want a sequence? We're shooting video. Like he's going to capture the scene, the environment. And so... Yeah. That I mean, was, don't get me wrong. A sequence is, has its time and place, but like, I mean, film was expensive. Like, yeah. So like, I remember you being like our first trip to Tahoe. You're like, I'm going to back seven this cliff. I was like, all right, I'm going to shoot a sequence. And you're like, just shoot two. 
and then we can move on because I only had a limited amount of film, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's not like the digi age where you can just like wrap off. But that was a battle. I always thought like, <laughs> yeah, if you could get that one singular image that captured the vibe and could show like the trick, then yeah, like I feel like that's got more of an impact in some ways. Unless it's like a, an NBD or something, you know, that's just like, that's kind of what I was going for. I'd be interested to hear, you know, every, every different photographer has their style of photography. How do you feel like you fit in specifically in the snowboard landscape as your kind of unique signature style? I don't know. I think it's like ever evolving. Like, I think it's pretty like probably confused right now, <laughs> <laughs> but it started out like pretty gritty and grimy, like a lot of black and white, a lot of like printing in the dark room, like having like the filed out, um, cartridge that like bled the bled the edges like a lot like a lot of influence from like rob mathis and and um chris brunkhard and then um but yeah moving into digi just a little a little less of a um a little less of a style i would say and more of just like stylistically just trying to be um almost like journalistic because i'm like ever since I was young, it's just like, I'm an observer, right? Like, I'm not like a guy that goes out there and like, will talk somebody's ear off and like be the life of the party or whatever. But like, I'm in the background and I'm like looking around the room and I'm just like, that looks cool. Like, I want to shoot a photo of that or that looks cool. And so like, I guess it's almost like a, an approach where you kind of find like that angle, like that's that kind of like sneaky angle that maybe like not everyone's going to find. Maybe there's something in the foreground. Maybe there's like something that frames up the rider or something like with, with like some comedy in it or some feeling, you know? So that's kind of what I'm going for. I don't know if I'm necessarily like nailing that, but like, I think you do. And like, I think like, you know, hearing you say this, it's like one of the things you really brought was like, you didn't impose some sort of set of rules on the session. You just, you were there working hard as if you were riding and going to get a clip, but then you were the photographer, which was sort of a different vibe. You weren't, you didn't bring in like, like a, some dogmatic knowledge from previous eras of <laughs> snowboarding, you know, you just yeah. were like, I'm just here part of the session and you weren't going to impose any sort of will upon it. You were just like, Let's get it, you know, except for the mute stiffy. That one you really, <laughs> really came down hard on me. There was this mute stiffy off this stump, and, like, I really nailed it. But Gus, That's the one that Gus ducked under? <laughs> yeah, that was a sick yeah. – uh, that was – we actually did get a good photo, didn't we? Yeah, I got published. Yeah. But yeah. but it was because, you know, I had you do a method. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I why went, I got published. <laughs> yeah, I went back with the method. <laughs> yeah, that was the only was like, time he ever – Like, kind of cool, that was but the only did time a method, he ever, really like, cool, or – he ever threw some weight at me. So like he our, did impose his will our, on our you. Our second day of it. <laughs> well, that, that, I got a little more comfortable over the years. So. Yeah. But that was pretty early. It's like, yeah, that's true. Maybe go back up and do the method. Maybe the method will be better. <laughs> <laughs> like, that felt pretty sick, bro. <laughs> no know, one's doing these the right stiff, now. <laughs> stiffy mute is photogenic. The locked out knees. Like, it's just, it's just a thing of beauty. I don't know. I, mean, yeah, I, I like the you, ones that, that Jim Rippey did when they were fully, like, out. Mm-hmm. Oh, now we're hearing that mine might not have been as good as oh, I thought. Oh, <laughs> might wow. not have just, yeah, might have just tweaked it a little, you know. <laughs> felt, felt better in the head type of scenario. Yeah, I, like I that. think that's what we just heard here. <laughs> well, we got a guest question from none other than Scott Stevens. Here we go. Mike, so excited to hear that you're on the show. Uh, I can't wait to listen. You're going to crack me up. I already know it. But uh, my question for you is uh, right brain, left brain era. I think in the bonus you have a uh, a line about how the tap spin is a way to the dark side <laughs> and you do it in like a Yoda voice. And um, man, I just so fortunate that I got to shoot with you for so long because you brought so much comedy. And uh, I've been with a, a few photographers over the years that like really bring up everybody's morale when everybody's uh, kind of going crazy trying tricks. But you are, are one of the best to ever do it. And uh yeah, I just like that line. Do um, you want to elaborate on that line? And also, um, there is no also, awesome, but uh, <laughs> it just ends there. The question ends there. Yeah. So tap spin is the way to the dark side. I don't. I don't. I don't really remember why we were doing that. Can I think you it, uh, just do the line though right now? 
the top spin is the way to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't really remember the context. I'm sorry, Scott. My memory has just shot over the years. So well, we were in Red Mountain, right? Oh, I think it was Jess Kimura was yeah, doing trying it. that tap spin. And yeah, she's trying to tap spin, and it's that was one of our right brain left brain trips where we went that's with right. two okay. crews, and they kind of separated them, and it was like one was right brain, one was left brain, and it was like we would go out and attack, and then we would come back at night and watch the footage. Yeah. And Ross was a filmer and Pico was a filmer. And then Yosh was splitting between the crews. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that yeah, that was a that was a really good time. I, I don't remember though exactly like I think it was just like kind of comedy hour in between takes, because it was just me and Ross Phillips, and Ross is like really good at um really good at just like capturing me doing just stupid shit and like this and it, we kind of egged each other on to where like the stupider the lifestyle or like the most insane lifestyle i could get was something that like i knew would make jesse laugh like in the edit bay so like we would just like stack these clips just like strictly for that but then somehow they would kind of sneak their way into like you know bonus edits or like the actual movie every once in a while so well ross is just gonna go straight to yosha's face after <laughs> like every make and ross doesn't you know he doesn't say much he just stays quiet, so you have to fill the space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he's quiet, and then Yosh would just come up with these crazy <laughs> things like Boner Jams 3000. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like, yeah, all the time. The right turn, left turn one, we did a whole nother section in the DVD of you. It's like seven minutes long of yeah. just you doing that. Yeah. <laughs> They're amazing. So good. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, the impersonation of Stevens with a muscle cramp? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, thanks, Brand Year? Is, is that thanks, Brain? Um, That was thanks, Brand Year, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. We, we're driving. Um, we're, drive, we're staying at Jesse's parents' house, which is up on Flat Top Mountain. And then I think we're going to turn again to film jumps, if, if I'm not. We're doing something where it's a pretty long drive. I think we were cruising around Ank. I think that was more of a street mission, but no, the 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 groin pole was something coming back from Aliesta. Okay. I remember okay. specifically, and like, <laughs> and uh, so we're driving in the car, um, and I I don't remember who was all in there, but for some reason, me and I think me and Scott are in the back of this Ford Ranger. Ranger like we're stuffed back there, and it's like. Not extended cap. Not extended cap. Like the seats, you have to sit <laughs> facing each other. It's mm-hmm. like the fold down seats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, all of a sudden, Scott just sits up and his like head like hits the <laughs> hits the ceiling, and he just grabs his groin like this, and he's just <laughs> <laughs> starts doing this, and I'm just like, dude, are you? What's going on? Are you okay? He's like, oh, I just, just, I just pulled my groin. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he just stays like that, and then and then he stand he's standing. And this is, we're stuffed in the back of this ranger. He's standing like this for like 45 minutes. Just like, I'm good. I'm good. Just, just, you know, I can't move, but like, I'm good. I'm good. Hand me those sour patches. Yeah. yeah. He's like, can I get some candy? <laughs> yeah. It's just like, I was like, dude, this is kind of crazy. You probably should stop eating BK Lounge like right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, dude. And then just like anything, we just took like the, that impersonation and just ran with it for like 15 years (laughs) you know (laughs) (laughs) like all of it is so amazing like the the what up yash like captions away to the dark side it's like you just find something and you just beat the brakes off of it oh yeah you just beat like the quad stack for example (laughs) yeah what it what is the story with the quad stack guy likes quad stacks Uh, for the record i don't like quad stacks (laughs) But you like to buy me them. He's like, dude, if I get this trick right now, I'm buying you a quad stack. I'm That's like, a four four patties of Burger King. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. like, I don't want a quad stack. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> we need that. I, I lost the ground. My track Get-a-back. record of sliding things across the table is really <laughs> crappy right now. Don't take this guy to shuffleboard table. <laughs> yeah. And then you got, and then obviously like stack footy too. It's just like. Stack footy. Did you Photoshop the, or was that Pika that did the actual logo with the, the rap logo? Oh, that's all Pika. Oh, that was Pika. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, stack footy was in such like stacking was in heavy rotation. As yeah, well. so quad stack. It was like if we got yeah. four shots, we'd get Mike a quad stack at Burger King, mm-hmm. but he yeah. didn't want the quad stack. But we just like <laughs> I'd still eat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he'd so be, like, a, he'd be like shaking his head, be like, like oh, God, man. so gross. God. <laughs> just like sitting there in Burger King. Like. Well, and mind you, like four shots is a lot of shots, right? But in think think world, like. It's like we go to a spot, we get 10 shots every <laughs> yeah. time. So it's yeah. like you're guaranteed getting a quad yeah. stack. Guaranteed quad stacks yeah. every day. But yeah. one of them could be for Stevens to wipe his butt with. You know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. A, one of them uh, could be toilet paper. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. Yeah. That's yeah. very true. The Burger King wrapper, yeah. That's Absolutely better. works well. No, the sandwich was in there. Oh, the sandwich is in there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. You didn't know that? I, I'm, I'm not uh, well versed on this thing. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The sandwich, the, it was chick, It was like a chicken, whatever their chicken is. Yeah. Huh. All right. Chicken sandwich. Mick chicken, or maybe it was McDonald's, but yeah. With sandwich in for more purchase. You yeah. Know. Wow. Yeah. Quick. I mean, um, you got to you gotta figure it out. You got to figure it out. You got to figure yeah. it out. Yeah, you got to figure it out. You know, a pork craftsman blames his tools, so yeah. you know, sometimes you got to use a burger. Yeah. <laughs> what about, I mean, while we're talking Stevens, you know, I've noticed he has a bit of a, it's almost like a different language when he starts trying tricks and he's talking and like he's talking before he even lands the trick and, and unstraps and uh how has it been with the inaudible ramblings of steven's mid-battle have you experienced that oh yeah i mean he's he's a special human he's like on another level so um yeah the rambling for sure i mean he's i gotta say that like, he would always like lie to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah he's kind of a liar <laughs> in a weird way um yeah because i remember like I don't know where we were, but we were like, it was like in a heated session where he's trying to do something like technical, right? And he's just the way he moves and on his snowboard, it's just like, to me, it's like dancing. Like, it's just insane. And like, I go up to him, I'm like, damn, dude, you, you must be such a good dancer. Like, he's like, no, nah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't dance. I don't ever dance. I've never danced in my entire life. No, I don't dance. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then like, fast forward to the rat skeller, like mid. <laughs> Like in dance party and like, I just see him just going crazy (laughs) on dance floor. I'm like, fucking liar. (laughs) Like, and then, uh, yeah, like all, all all sorts of like stuff, like just like, like, Hey, like maybe we can get like a back. At one point I was like really obsessed. He's got a really good back lip and I was really obsessed on maybe getting like back lip photo of him. And he was like, no, I don't really, really know how to do that trick. Next year I see in the mag. Like the most squared up back lip on a wood rail. I'm like, mm-hmm. dude. <laughs> yeah, thanks, bro. Yeah, thanks, bro. <laughs> Boreal. Is it that Boreal, one? Boreal, yeah. yeah. Squared up. Just so sick. Wow. That's really good. What I gotta do dots. What I gotta do dots. What I gotta do dots. He like doesn't have time to do the words, you know. And, it's like, the, and like when he lands something, like as he's riding away, he's like, maybe. And you're like, dude, you your board just touched the snow. And yeah, that's yeah, the one. Yeah, that was yeah. the one. Like yeah. he's still processing whether it's a make or not, like mid trick. He's already strapped back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In his mind, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another thing is like the quickness of the unstrap. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just like And the strap in. Just yeah. That oh, guy's nothing the grinds his gears. Like somebody with slow ratchets on like a drop and ramp in front of them or whatever. Yeah. Whew. I mean, yeah, that guy's the, like that guy's case. All the step on s- bindings out there, they really, they they really consider him a major threat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a John Henry versus the the steam drill type situation. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen the videos of people stacking the cups real quick? That's like Stevens with his binding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he's talking to everybody and to himself while it's all happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. You guys got some good imagery. Uh, what's your What's your favorite Stevens image? You got anything that comes to mind? Stevens. I mean, I didn't really like get, uh, we were kind of on an every other year program for a while there. Um, but it was always such a highlight. Like he would always come to the table with something so photogenic and like often an NBD. So it was like just such a pleasure to work with that dude. Um, I think maybe the one thing that sticks out is that um, the double, double page ad we had for stack footy. That's what yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, same thing. Um, it, and it was a morph sequence, um, him doing a front, f- it was like a step up jump to like a pad and there was another j- little jump to like a step down. And it, this was something that Crush um, Airhorn for Crush had built when he at his tenure at um, 
some of it's no qualm me. But yeah, he like nollie fronts up, lands. He's had he has one strap like barely strapped, and then unstraps and then into a one footer. Um, Unstrap actually happens in the air. Yeah, and which yeah, is true, insane, true. And but originally he was trying something different. I think he was trying. I think he like, wanted to back a front flip, back flip, or I don't know. With the, yeah, it was going to be more. Yeah. It might have been the unstrap on the front flip and then one foot back flip, man. Yeah, I think that's what he wanted to do originally. But we had to kind of just level down a little bit because it was so quick. But yeah. yeah, unstrap in the air and then just like, just the way that Pika laid out that ad too is just so iconic to me with stack footy like behind, like the the, the background was totally knocked out in the gold letters. Um, yeah. Yeah, that Classic. was sick. That's definitely like sticks out and in my mind. Did you mind. shoot the backflip fast plant on the Yeah, I mean I, I kind of I want to say that was kind of my idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he had it in his mind too, but I was like, yo, these chairlifts are like really close to the ground. What if we like pushed up a jump and you could like fully back foot or uh, backflip foot plant this chair? Um Yeah, and then a bunch of cool he did the he did the um nose blunt. The back nose blunt too, like the yeah, one, the one, the one footed footer across the box. Oh yeah, yeah. What was the uh, the sequence for stack footy? Was that the infamous quote? Uh, front flips were cool maybe like ten years ago. Was that <laughs> that's <laughs> that was Patrick? Patrick. Yeah. That was Patrick. Okay, yeah. That was when he was in his uh, Coors all, goggles, all camo, all camo <laughs> outerwear, fur on the collar. <laughs> yeah, fur on the collar. Talking what what we now call shit. a doubt fit. <laughs> 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 But I don't know, kind of coming back into style, all over yeah. print, snow camo. Yeah. I forgot about the doubt fit term. Yeah. You got an outfit and then you got a doubt fit. Yeah. 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 Well, so. that's a, this is a great question because you're known, for people that don't know, I want to provide a little context. Like, let's say we're talking streetwear. Uh, you might, you're, the footwear might be some like DVSs from 03 that are about the puffiest pieces of footwear you can find on the market mixed with like an all camo or like an all white kit or just incredible fashion uh sense i'm just kind of curious to you what goes into a good kit what goes into a good yosh kit man i don't know i'm kind of like uh, how are you so steezy i kind of just have like my four things i feel like that i just cycle through but um i don't know i'm just uh i kind of think like just don't mix and match a little too much if you got like a wild a wild shirt or whatever like wear some black pants and black shoes and vice versa um but yeah, I don't know. I do a lot of vintage these days. I'm not really like super, super clued into in, into brands right now. But like, I don't know. I just I'm just easy, bro. Yeah, it's just <laughs> bored. You just bored with it. It's something you yeah. can't really. Yeah, you can't replicate this shit. Yeah. Biggie blind. No, <laughs> the yeah. biggie blinds. Check the biggie blinds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up with the biggie blinds? Uh, the biggie blinds was uh, something that I had. Um, you know those like, uh, you know those blinds that are, are the vertical blinds where yep. you can twist them and and it'll go dark and then you twist them again and they, they churn like, like this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands back in the day during the summer months and I figured out how to like rasterize like a, a, a Google a Googled image onto like these, these blinds. I was like, this would be really cool if I could like rasterize a big old image on these blinds. So like for some reason I was like, I'm going to do something like a, a photo of notorious B I G <laughs> and it, rasterized it through this program and then like took it to FedEx and the uh, Kinko's and they printed out basically eight and a half by 11s that like rasterized. And if you put them all together, it makes this big image and it turned out pretty cool. Cause it was like kind of pixelated and sketchy looking, but then I mod podged it onto every single blind, like had to cut them out vertically. How did you get it on there? Wheat paste? Yeah. Just mod podge. Oh, that's, that's an wheat, actual wheat. Thing. It's like wheat paste. Okay. Yeah. Just like a glue. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I had that run into the house for a while. The biggie blinds. We did like a cribs <laughs> in Yoshi's house. <laughs> well, I always wanted to do because you, you can spin it and then it'll be go to the other side of the blind. And I always wanted to do Tupac on the other side. Mm. But that's that's maybe just like an idea for somebody else who's motivated. Mm -hmm. Go out there and get it. Mm -hmm. Bertner, you prefaced an interesting flat screen TV story. Maybe you could paint some context on that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Yosh got his new house <laughs> in Bellingham, and along with his new house, he got this new 
liquid crystal display TV, which was like hot, fresh on the market, flat screen. And that was the year. Thanks, brain year. <laughs> Yosh's favorite year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, so I had uh, Jesse and I don't know if Jesse came up, but I had maybe Scott and Chris or. I was there. You were there? Yeah. Yeah. We had some, we had the crew come up and stay at the house. And I just bought this new house and then my first house with my first flat screen TV. And, um, you know, Scott, he's always watching videos like oh, yeah. nonstop. Oh, yeah. And, um, and sure enough, like we wake up in the morning and I look over and like, thanks, Brain's just on the TV. It's been on all night. It's the menu. The mm-hmm. DVD menu, yeah. And oh, I'm like, oh, nightmares. Cool. Like, it's watching bright, thanks, Brain. Bright orange and bright green. Yeah. Fluorescent. And uh, I turn the TV off and it's just like burned into the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude. <laughs> My first house, my first flat screen TV, and you just like ruined it. It's <laughs> like, literally like physically burned into the LCD. So yeah. anything you watch, you get the ghost of thanks brain. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thankfully, it just was like burned into the screen for like a little bit, and then it, it faded. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, I was like, that was kind of a heartbreaking moment for a second. Kind of a legendary moment at the same time. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Speaking of, of uh, DVD menus, I just got to derail for a sec because I live with Scott for one winter here in Salt Lake. And uh, he was a big, anybody that knows Scott knows he's a big Seinfeld guy. And uh, he would fall asleep with, like, in the, on, like, the living room TV would still be on, like, full volume with the Seinfeld menu. And for anybody that's familiar with the Seinfeld DVDs, it's just a baseline looping for ten <laughs> hours. So I'd be in my room and just be like bam 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 and you're just like Jesus, but you're not gonna get up. You're just annoyed and pissed off for like an entire eight hour session at night. But yeah. Thanks, friends. Not quite as annoying, but it's yeah. like boop 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 What is burning into his TV It's like smoking Bogart's burning in You made it, Yosh. But everyone came with you. Yeah. The whole crew is on your floor. Squad. <laughs> Ball candy references in full force, too. <laughs> yeah. Ball candy, I don't even know if we get into it because it doesn't really make sense. But, I mean. No, nah, it's a little too fringe. It's kind of dark and fringe. Yeah. yeah we don't, that, it's just like anticlimactic and confusing. Yeah. But, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mix of skull candy and. Andreas Wig throwing a snowball and catching it in his pants. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, what's not to understand about what's, that? What's not to love? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then us doing that all the time and calling it for, ball candy. For, for like five years. It's this dance, too. It's like you kind of look like you're swinging some big ones down there. And it's in true uh, ball candy fashion, you may want some unplugged skull candies in as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over the ears. <laughs> yep. Okay, good stuff. Uh, all right. Well, we probably got a bunch of guest questions here. Uh, it probably will take us out of chronological, but oh, you know, we got one from Pika that's perfect for right now. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Yosh, it's Pika. This is awesome. I can't wait to hear this interview. Uh, okay, my question for you is what is the, your favorite trip you've ever been on and why? And if it's not Patrick Patterns, when we went to the Arlberg, I will be super surprised. And what on earth could possibly be drinking Romulan ale with hookah, <laughs> pipe smoking, scuba divers? <laughs> and also, can you guys please take a group photo for me? <laughs> group picture. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Love you, Pika. That's amazing. Um, best trip. Gosh, there's been so many of them. I would say, I would beg to differ that our first trip to Hakuba is like something really special. Yeah. Um, so yeah, our first trip to Hakuba, and I think we had set it up, Hakuba's in Japan, it's on the main island, and I think we had set it up to do like a week in Hakuba and then a week 
in, in Hokkaido, which is another island. Other way around. Other way around. Other way around. Yeah. Okay. Which is like, looking back now, it's like quite an ambitious lift. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah. Two weeks, two locations and in a in a foreign country. Um, but yeah, that trip was amazing. And like just settling into Hakuba and connecting with like Ken Ken and, and I'm Maki. I'm so glad and, you brought up Ken Ken and yeah. Mackie. Yeah, and like, man, those two, we like rolled into the, the local shop, which is Garage 902, and we just met those two guys right off the bat. And it, it was just like, they were just, friends. they were just like, think, think. Like, they just like looked over at Jesse and they're just like, think, think. They like knew. Like, <laughs> yeah. think, think was popping in Japan, like along with like Tech Nine and like a lot of other things. But like, I think like, think, think was just so relatable to a Japanese snowboarder. And so it really resonated, and it was probably, I don't know, what year was that? That was, like, several years deep. Like, <laughs> so. That was thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian, yeah. Yeah. So, but post-patchwork pattern, like, people, like, after patchwork, people knew, like, that yeah. really put it on the map. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, and just meeting those guys and them just, like, opening up the culture to us and, like, what Hakuba's about, and we just kind of went there blindly not knowing, like, the places, like, insane like it's called the snowiest place on earth for a reason um so we would like switch between like riding street and riding pow and that's kind of like my favorite formula like i would a lot of times like in the height of my career when i was traveling a lot i would try and line up trips where it would be go on a street trip go on a backcountry trip street trip and trying to alternate that because i never wanted things to get too stale but this was like and Think Think was always good like that. We could always adapt because everyone wanted to ride everything. So it never got too stale. Um, but yeah, that trip was really special. We got to like meet some awesome people and just like enjoy Japanese culture together. I think a couple of guys that was their first time to Japan. And that's always like so fun and special to watch. Um, yeah, definitely a highlight. It, it's interesting to think too, you've been to Japan with a multitude of crews. You went there. Think Think with patchwork for patchwork gear and years past that as well. And then you went there with Travis Rice or Mark Landvik and crew for uh, Art of Flight, I believe, or one yep. of those ones. Mm -hmm. And then you went there to ride the domes with um, Ben Ferg and yep. Blum and stuff. Uh, how do you, how, how does the what are the differences like comparatively when you, just, you know when you're linking up with Travis versus Think Think versus the Snow Dome? I'd love to hear kind of how those things vary. Yeah, well, I mean, Travis's whole program, especially back then, was just, it's otherworldly. It's its own entity, and you can't really, like, compare that to anything else. It's just, like, you're on the Brain Farm program. That's just, like, it's a gnarly production. And honestly, like, me being thrown into that world, like, I wouldn't say I thrived because it's kind of, like, as a photographer, you're, like, pitted against, like, there's a like so many filmers and like producers and directors that are like basically like you're just by yourself like they don't really care about your photo it's about the video right so like you kind of got to get sneaky but like um i mean i've always been good with that so like i fit right into that as far as that style of shooting like i can adapt to that but um as far as like the big production like that was just insane to see and like and and it makes sense though, because like some of these tricks these guys are doing, you need a drone angle to show for context. You need like a slow mo guy. You need all this stuff to like actually put context to some of this this trickery because it's just like that's the best way to capture it. So I totally understand. But like, um, yeah, sorry to go on a rant, but like, it's 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 its own category, right? And we're think thanks like complete opposite. It's like more low budget, more grassroots. There's one other filmer, probably two, but like the second angle is gonna be a homie filmer probably. Um, and then Jesse was always great about like, dude, like let's get the photo. Like let's make sure we get a good photo. And like, that was like huge. And when somebody gives you that advantage, like you gotta take that. Like, and Which there's- was, you know, all based off of the relationship because like I wasn't a photo guy before we started working together. Right. Like, it was like, I didn't know how to break through. But then, in that, like, when we started working together, I couldn't even open up a magazine without being in it. You know, it was, like, totally new for me. I used to battle so hard to get a one shot from Super Park or something. And then, 
they'd spell my name wrong or it would be someone else with my name on the photo. You know, it was just like, photo is so difficult. And then whatever our chemistry was, like you're, you and our group, Jeno and myself and Pika and everybody involved, it was like, this is our guy. And you were just like, make it happen. Like we were like, dude, we're in magazines. Like Jeno and I had those, that list of like what you had to do to consider yourself a snowboard, you know, like having a snowboard career. And like Mike checked like so many of those boxes for us. Like this, you know, the, the checkout, the, the double page spread, the cover, like my first cover, you know, was with Mike and like, you know, Gus and, you know, so many people just put on the map from that relationship. So. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I can't attribute it all to my photography because it's like very symbiotic. Right. And I think that was like when Jesse started getting published a lot more, it's just like, that was when you started stepping into like different tricks and like getting more creative too. So like it, 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 it funneled and channeled that way. And also like, I always had a good reputation with the magazines. And I think that's like a huge, um, talking point as far as like, you got to foster those relationships and make sure you're not burning bridges and just like doing your due diligence to make, to show up and like also like follow through, like, like email these people like several times while magazines are productions like hey are you using my photos okay you're not like let's move on i'm gonna give it to the next mag you know like and, and shopping your stuff around and being smart about that um so yeah sorry to kind of derail from the actual no, that, question no, that was great but. that was a perfect answer and perfect perfectly articulated and uh just thinking of you talking about how you shot your first cover and i'm curious what what was your first cover that you ever got published what mag what was the photo I think I think it was McCarthy. We got published a uh, photo for Mount Baker on the Cat Track Gap, um, and it was a German magazine, Playboard. Oh yeah, Sick. yeah, yeah. So that was the first, um, yeah. And then what about North American mags? When North American mag would have been. Um, Either Snowboard or Snowboarder magazine. I don't know. It I, I got... Was it Luke Math? Yeah. Yeah. Or was it the Frequency cover? Because those were the same year. Yeah. So I got four covers that year. The Playboard Whoa. magazine, <laughs> Whoa, bro. Snowboarder, Snowboard mag, and then Frequency. I think Frequency came out last and Playboard came out first, but I can't remember where the other two land, but kind of around the same time. Do you remember time. our cover ceremony? Yeah, pour, <laughs> pouring out the drink on the cover. Yeah. And then, like, letting it, you let it dry and then framed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had, like, a legit slushy daiquiri or something, made us, like, these blended drinks. And then Yosh came over and poured it on the mag and just let it, and then we signed it and let it, like, soak in. Which photo was it? It's like I'm hiking out of the jump. With at, the tracks. Yeah. yeah. The, it, the track off the lip and the track in the landing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's such a sick photo, dude. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Yeah, at a ASI, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, that so lake. you FT'd it? FT'd, front five, yeah. Mm. I was wondering if you guys fudged it or not. No, landed Like you it. tomahawked, but then you can't see the tracks <laughs> and you rode out still? <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> no, it was a lander. No, it was a lander. It, it's in the yeah. bonus. Cool. <laughs> it wasn't good enough for the vid, but. Fuck it. That's yeah. a, such a cool concept of a cover, too, just one track and you hiking out. Yeah, it was a cool cool session. McCarthy got a banger that day. Yeah. Double line. Really right. sick. Right, yeah. Because you can go cliff to gap mm -hmm. at that spot. It's a really cool spot. Yeah. People need to go back and mess that thing up. So then we didn't really talk about how you were staff photog for K2 for a number of years, correct? Uh, no, we haven't talked about it. So, yeah, that. well, how did that come about? Yeah, so I think, I think that that – that breakout year for me when I had got the, gotten the four covers, like I was kind of on the map all of a sudden, you know, and, um, um, just making a little bit of a buzz in the industry and people were recognizing my name and granted, like alongside those four covers, I got like a lot of photos published in the mags, um, had formed a really good relationship with Jeff Baker. And he was like, he was, um, really publishing a bunch of my stuff. And then, um, and then Pat Bridges too, over at, at snowboarder, he was, he was really receptive to what I was doing. And like, also there wasn't a lot of people shooting in the Northwest, you know, like a lot of people would just be like a lot of photographers in general, I think were kind of like, well, that's not really where you go to shoot. 
you know, you want to go to like a place where it snows a lot and then gets sunny. You want to go to your Tahoes. You want to go to your Utahs. You want to go to your Whistler's. Granted, Whistler's not the sunny spot, but like, you know, there's a cemented like legendary community there that's like ready to go. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I was put on the map and then, and then through like, I was shooting with Sean McKay a bunch too, um, who was pro for K2 at the time. And I also got linked in with, uh, Vile Luoma, um, through like, through Volcom, uh, originally because, um, they, they came up to Baker to shoot a scramble and Landvik was, um, in the mix and he invited me out a couple times. So. I got a chance to shoot with him and formed a relationship. And uh, when it came time for the ne that next season, um, yeah, they were looking for a photographer and they wanted somebody local and they wanted somebody who could shoot product specifically. Um, and so I got, my name got thrown in the mix and I was already liked by some of the team riders. You know, I knew Leanne Pelosi as well. And, um, that always helps when you have, when the riders have your back going into something like that. Absolutely. Cause it's like the riders want to work with somebody who's not only a good photographer, but somebody they want to hang out with and like can like hang and like crack jokes or whatever, you know? So like it definitely pays to like foster those relationships. But, um, but yeah, I think Lance Hacker was the yep. team manager at the time. He didn't last too long, but I met, I interviewed with him and then Daniel Hamilton was the, um, was the marketing director and we just like me and Lance just hit it off. I was like, this guy is cool. Like he gets it. Um, so a couple interviews out in Vashon and, and they were really like adamant that like, yeah, we really want somebody who can shoot, um, studio photography. And I was just like, I don't never done that before. But like what I did was I went out and, um, I was like, Hey, I don't really shoot, um, you know, studio photography, but what I'll do is I'll go out to Glazers and I'll rent some lights. Glazers is a camera store in Seattle. I'll rent some lights and I'll do like kind of like a mock studio photo shoot. And I ended up like uh, hitting up uh, Pat Lennox Wright. He was like a really established, sick product photographer. And I still think he shoots for Burton and um, kind of picked his brain for a little bit. He was like, he was like, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it, but like, if I were to do it, I would be using soft boxes and grids. And like, he kind of gave me a couple clues. And so I kind of figured out a couple things from him and then, um, and then did this mock shoot and sent him the images and was just like, they're like dog shit images. They were horrible, but they're like <laughs> stoked. They're like, dude, this guy like tried, like he wants the job, you know? And so, yeah, I ended up getting the job. I remember when I, found out that I had got it. It was like, they weren't going to tell me yet, but they had told the team writers and I was at a premiere with Sean McKay and he was getting kicked out of a bar at, at this like people premiere or whatever. And as he's like, get kicked out, he's like getting stuffed by the bouncer. He's like, dude, you got the job. And he's, he, gets <laughs> thrown, he got thrown out, kicked to the curb. And I was like, I got, I got the job. <laughs> just like looking around, like nobody like to talk to you. Just like, okay. Sweet. McKay's getting curb stumped. Yeah, McKay's <laughs> getting curb stumped. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile. <laughs> but yeah, it was a really funny way to like find out. And um, yeah, so like it just went full speed. They were just like, Danielle was just like, yep, just get like a, um, get like an airline credit card and like you don't have a travel budget. It's unlimited. Just like swipe the card. Let's Air go. horn. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. called, that's called burning some buds right there. Yeah. That almost deserves a homies cooked montage right there. Yeah, that, that, a long that. version of homies hey, cooked. Yo, yeah. homies cooked. <laughs> hey, yo, what the fuck? Homies cooked. <laughs> hey, yo, homies cooked. Are you a good? <laughs> hey, I see my homies cooked. <laughs> Are you a good? <laughs> homies <laughs> cooked. <laughs> Are you good? Oh, sorry. the are you good? We are good. Thanks. We it. are good. Yeah. Dolly, we thanks are for asking good. us. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Dolly. <laughs> I appreciate that. So you, so we let's just talk about burning some budge here. Yeah, were, I mean, were you were you roasting budge or what? I wasn't really roasting budge. I was oh. always like keeping it on track, and um, I don't know. I mean, I was still using my own credit card, so it was just kind of like I'd still have to get reimbursed, you know. So mm, I never yeah. really wanted to go too ham, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just a good feeling just to know that I could burn budge and like, um, they definitely like, yeah, they laced me up pretty good. I mean, I went in and like, 
I went into the factory and shot an entire catalog and I slept in the factory. I was just like, I will do whatever it takes. Like I'm going to like, I, I have that. to like hone my skills. Like I need to be here just shooting photos like all the time. And like looking back, like I didn't need to do that. And like, nobody does that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like being just young and hungry and just like wanting to learn, like, I remember like after I had shot that catalog, the brand manager came up to me and was like, dude, good job. I've never seen anybody work as hard as you. Like, you're sick. And I was just like, cool. Like I had already proved myself and we haven't even gotten on snow yet. So mm -hmm. like it was a good feeling. And like I had like so many good years with K2. They were like just, I mean, the team riders alone just were so sick, like traveling with VLA. Granted, like it was kind of like, on his way out, like just seeing his like ability and power and then like linking with like Louis Fountain um, and Sean McKay was like always in the mix. And it gave me and like, it's funny because it gave me a little like, I was kind of like, oh shit, I'm not going to be able to shoot with Think Tank much anymore. But like then Beresford and like Tim Eddy came around and I was like, oh shit, I have like an excuse now. Like, and the cool thing about that was like think tank was always going on like early trips like november and december like nobody's even shooting until like january usually like the big dogs so we would already be like stacking for like two months before anybody had even like started to roll camera quad stack yeah quad stacking daily hey cut you i'm getting a bit of a nose whistle from you so <laughs> so so no so just say if you're if you're like if you're off the mic you could just like give it a little one of these it's because it's picking up. It's picking up your, your like, oh, there's a little whistle. You might not be able to hear in that, but I just wanted to, like. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That, how do we do, let's but, not yeah. cut that out. Yeah, keep it in there. <laughs> keep it in there. <laughs> <laughs> what, you, know, you know what I just remembered? Total sidebar? Uh, Seth sniffs. Oh, yeah. Do you, I mean, this is another, this is another obscure. <laughs> That'll get rid of the nose whistle. <laughs> yeah, should we uh, pop one? I, yeah. So, you can go. you explain the Seth sniff? Can you explain it? Yeah, yeah, I can explain it. I mean, it's like the intro of a people part. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, wow. and it's like Seth has hit his head at a spot, probably in Finland, and he's like... Minnesota. It's really scary. Yeah, it's really scary, but he's like... You can see he's, he's hit his head, his hair is all wet, and I think he's probably bleeding out Blood, of his head. Yeah. Everyone's like it's like the camera's on him, like he's on the ground, and everyone's around him, and he's like... What does he say? He's like, I think I'm good. And he just looks right at the camera and goes, <laughs> 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 Yes, dude. That was the best Seth sniff since Seth sniff. <laughs> okay, let's do them together with the songs. And my, mind you, also the Seth sniff got the brakes beaten off of it yeah, for a okay, solid yeah. 10 years. So that's after how it that. started. That's yeah. how it started. And then, you know, we just like freaked out when we saw this like <laughs> sniff lifestyle and we started just doing it all the time like <laughs> at the end of a sentence or something like just stop for a second go quiet and then just be like <laughs> <laughs> so now now we have the evolution the cess sniff to smelling salt yeah, cess sniff which has never been done this is the nbd yeah nbd right. who's gonna start it We're gonna I'll, go I'll, I'll crack it off yeah. okay Oh, <laughs> oh, dude, I don't think that's good. Oh. Wow. wow. Pretty good? Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. All right. This is going to clear the sinuses. Yeah. Oh, damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man, those smelling salts really... Oh, fuck, man. Whew. It's kind of got to be like a one eye yeah. close. Like, yeah, yeah, you got to yeah. do one nostril. I, yeah. You kind of went double nostrils. <laughs> It's he, be, he's like he's like is it bleeding yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. close the eye and then go in the right <laughs> yeah. close the left eye go in the right <laughs> <laughs> and kind of shake your jowls <laughs> we'll have to cue the clip on the screen for the also reference. like shout out to Seth for being such a good like yes that's a legend a, a good uh, sport about all that because he knew about it and we would do it let's give him we do it in front of him I'll and he would sick. yeah <laughs> but we were just like on that still on that like fan level Think Tank crew, where we just like, there was always this other level of like, that we were still just fanning out on pro, the pro snowboarders that were. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they ruling was, the day, you know? There was always that top tier. Yeah. And snowboard, so, creme yeah. de la creme. Mm -hmm. Like, and like, every once in a while, there's just something a little off and like, 
what was up with that one shot? Like everything's perfect, but there's this one lifey that you're like, mm-hmm. dude, we need to like gr- get into that mm-hmm. one. Like, yeah, like Jeremy Chons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Chons on the backside of Sugar Bowl. Chug- Jeremy's crazy in the backside of Sugar Bowl. <laughs> You just grab something, you run with it. It's yeah. fuel for the whole year, you know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Oh, is that uh, follow me around or what is the Jeremy? No, it's no, a it's, it's a standard. It's, oh, I think it's I think standard. it's, I think oh, it's okay. paradox oh, okay. in the beginning when he was riding like the um, it's big mountain, the Mads, grizzly got spine Joe or whatever. Johnson, got it. Yeah, Mads Johnson, Johnson. Johnson's good. That's talking great. about great reference. Yeah. Largest front three ever done. That mm. guy, world record front three. <laughs> Such a beast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you know what I think it's time for? Yes. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about the Icon Pass because winter is right around the corner. Resorts are about to start opening. They got the Icon Session Pass starting at only $319 adult. The Icon Pass Session 2-Day, 3-Day, and 4-Day Pass options offer a range of affordable entry points for the over 50-plus Icon Pass mountains. They also got the Icon Base Pass with limited blackout days across most of the 50-plus mountains. And of course, they got the Icon Pass. Only the Icon Pass provides the most access to the most mountains with no blackout dates. That's every bit of good stuff possible. They got over 178,000 skiable acres across more than 50 destinations worldwide. The good stuff is almost here. Again, from only $319 adult, stay ready with your at Icon Pass to 50 plus destinations worldwide. All right, Yosh, this is uh, is pretty big for you here. It's huge, actually. Yeah, I'm bummed that I get an (laughs) F-stop. Yeah. (laughs) That's going to be a stinger. Yeah. (laughs) Credibility's down. Yeah, way down. (laughs) Way down. There's some brands that were thinking about hiring you, but they actually were like, this guy is not credible. Mm-hmm. Doesn't know what the F-stop means. Uh, what's your confidence level, 0 through 10? Um, I'm going to say like a 6 or 7, because mm-hmm. I think you're going to lob me a meatball, but... That's you know. pretty high, high yeah. like confidence level. Do you level. think he's going to get it, Murder? It's not quite... A lob. But it's not quite a lob. Oof, okay. <laughs> it's like, I take it's it down like, to a 3, then. <laughs> yeah. It's like an off, off-pace off slider. You know, Oof. it's not just like... it, But it doesn't have a lot of movement. But it's hittable. Mike did dress up as Ichiro for multiple Halloweens. Okay. So he can hit an off-pace slider. Okay. Wow. Great. Great fun fact. Okay, let me find... I'm on the right, wrong thing. Okay, here we go. Cody Merrill, on your board. That's Scott Stevens in right brain, left brain. Wow. Wow. You did it. You did it. Mike. I mean, I heard him talk into the... That was actually a, a bit of a lob. With the, but yeah, it you, was. But you got the video, right? And there's a, he's got... You, you got to have a skill to know the... That's one of my favorite Scott video parts. Yeah. That's you one know of my what, favorite videos, Do you know where he's saying too. that? Bodie Merrill, holla at your boy. Do you know what he's doing? Bonus points for that <sighs> moment. I don't know. One footer? Nope. I know. Obviously. Let's just say Robert Shuval may be involved with this one. No, I don't know. A shovel. Yeah. Mighty, oh. It's the shovel front flip handspring thing. Mm-hmm. Mighty Midwest snowboard tour. Dude, look at this swag. Proper. Dude. Yeah, so we got a, you got a bomb hole package there for the bomb hole merch. We got a bunch of new hats in there. Oh, going to need these for sure. Front through wall smelling salts. All that stuff's available at bombhole.com. I like the bag, too. Yeah, you kind of secured the bag. Secured the one. bag. Thank I you think so I'm developing much. a smelling salts habit after <laughs> yeah. this episode. Yeah. <laughs> like, remember um, the MTV show True Life? Like, but it's like True Life. I'm addicted to smelling salts. Imagine, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. imagine the spoof you can make with <laughs> yeah. that. Like a good skit. Um, I brought some gifts for you, Chris. Oh, we got gifts. Okay, awesome. Um, let me see. Okay. Oh wow. We got a tube. We're a little tubey. But first off, we have. Uh, I bought you a couple zines. These are a couple of the zines. Um, here's America's hat. Wow, thank you. That's our Canada-based one. Um, oh, and that? Oh, so it's not nation. That might, yeah, that has stickers. the stickers in yeah, there. It's got, we got some Yosh stickers. We got Soy Sauce Nation stickers. We also have 
I am a Japanese fucking tourist you, zine. Look at this. Yep. And then um, high quality wow. zines. Teddy Q. Yeah. Teddy's in the mix. Wow. Um, let's see. What else do I got here? This is this is the grand finale right here. You're oh, gonna be a, this. We, you, you, you're not even gonna know what to do here. We got a finale drum happening. Roll, drum roll, please. So I've, Harrison Gordon. In this one. You know, I've been shooting a lot of photos over the years. Okay. And I noticed you have a lot of insane memorabilia here. Yes, so we do. I got you a print. Okay. Wow, this is exciting. And this, this is exciting. some of my best work. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think you're gonna like this. This is one of your dear friends. Mm. Um, mm. Oh wow, this thing's wrapped up ever so ever so nicely. For mm. the listeners, he's unraveling a print of sorts. You can hear the paper crinkling. It's, this is the ASMR part of the show. Yeah, the I'll let you do the reveal. Oh, we're gonna. It's like a gender reveal. Like it's like a gender reveal. Don't okay. start a forest go. fire. I'm going to do it so we everybody can see it. Oh, oh, it's upside down. This way? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> 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 that is uh, such a wild card. <laughs> That's beyond. This is... Well, for the listeners, it's Joe Sexton uh, in his in his like uh, hippie. What was that skater? Shane, Cr- Shane, Shane Cross. Cross. Shane Cross phase stepchild, uh, looking nothing like he looks now. Really, <laughs> almost a different lifetime at this point, point. Uh, and he looks ridiculous. So yeah, this is going to go in my office. This is a personal one. Um, wow, the unbelievable! Whole lead up to that too, right? <laughs> nice classic Yosh dry humor delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I was expecting. <laughs> Better than what I expected. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, it's going to be like a Scott image of him doing something sick. Yeah, no. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Yosh. Throw it back in the tube. Dude. That one's. I'm gonna have to get a nice frame for that for like behind my my behind my desk or something like that. Shout out to J Sex the kid. <laughs> wow, that was a great era for J Sex. He was a golden god when that picture was taken. That was shot at the old Ozone. Oh wow! Did you ever go to the ozone? Yeah, so yeah. I've heard it called the hozone as well. Um, yeah, allegedly yeah, for, for sure. legal purposes. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. A lot of oppo out shit back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've actually seen. Um, I'm not going to name names, but I've seen a pro snowboarder we're all familiar with uh, urinating at the bar while ordering drinks uh, at the ozone. Hmm. Can I guess? Sure. Travis Kennedy. <laughs> nope. Uh, one of his rap lyrics may have been O3 Tundra with a sled in the back. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> wow, thank you for these gifts, Yosh. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, the, I figured those would be good ones to have in the, in the you, office here. Do you have the photo of Sexton on your site for sale, the print shop? Yeah, we'll, we'll put that in the queue. <laughs> yeah, you can only build, like buy it like really big size. Yeah. Yeah. Sexton blinds in the near future? Yeah, maybe we'll do some sexy blinds. <laughs> What about yeah? What about blinds by Yosh? You figure out some manufacturing and just giant sexton blinds for sale. I, yeah, I mean, I you have consider one sold right here. You, know? <laughs> you got a you got a house with some windows that need some blinds. There so. you go. I got a question. That zine. I'm a I'm a Japanese fucking tourist. Yeah. So you're Japanese American, right? And we would go to Japan, and your parents are first generation. My fa- my father's second, second generation, generation and my mother's first generation. First generation yeah. Japanese American. Yeah. Spoke Japanese in the house. Yeah, well my mom's Japanese. She's from Japan. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we spoke Japanese in the house growing up. Yeah. And we would go to Japan and we're tourists. Yeah. And you'd be with us and you you're a total tourist. Yeah. And then every once in a while you'd be like, No, they said this and you would tell us what they said. Yeah. And we were like, What the hell, dude? Like <laughs> Do you speak this language? Like, help us out here. I remember one time we were at Kuro Neko. Yeah. And we're doing all this stuff and trying to figure out how to get our bags to Tokyo. We were in Hakuba. Yeah. And just this total miscommunication. And then finally it gets all sorted and you're like, they're totally making fun of us right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing is I like, for some reason, I'm better at understanding than actually speaking. Okay. So like my vocabulary, it takes me like, a while to like warm up to it to be in Japan to like get my words back. So like 
I can understand a lot a lot of stuff, but when I go to talk, sometimes it just doesn't come out. So that's like the reason why I can understand more than actually like speak. Mm. We always thought weird. that was hilarious and then blew it way out of proportion <laughs> <laughs> as, <laughs> as tends to happen. <laughs> That's on brand. That is yeah. on brand. Yeah. So part two, almost forgot for name that video part. This is actually for the listeners. This isn't for you, Yosh. And if you know this song, comment on the photo of Yosh on Instagram when this episode comes out. And that's where we pick our winner. We need writer and video part, not just, not just one or the other. Here we go. Shout out to Holden Barthard. He picks the he picks the winner. Here we go. Okay, that's tough. Thank I you guys. I think I know it for playing. Name that video part. So we haven't talked uh, Snowboarder Magazine yet, which you had a strong tenure over there. And we just happened to get a question from the legendary John Cavan about the Snowboarder Mag days. Here we go. Yosh, what up? It's Gavin. Hey, I feel like we had uh, quite the crew when we were all working together at Snowboarder. I mean, from snowboarding together to traveling around the world to karaoke. <laughs> but I was wondering if you could tell Chris and the crew what the game of getting flexed on was and how it may have escalated. <laughs> Thanks. Hope all's well. Yes, Kevin. Kevin's the man. I'm stoked to uh, have him as an Oceanside homie. I get to see him on the regular. Um, yeah, getting flexed on. I don't know how that really started or who started it, but I mean, all sorts of antics when we were in that that office, like some of my best memories just like hilarious times between like t-bird or huggy or bridges like just like if anybody knew the crew at that time it was just like they knew we were like really formed like voltron and like made an impact and everybody just loved the crew everywhere we went so it was like really special time but Mm -hmm. At some point, we started this thing called flexing on each other, and like you would kind of wait until somebody like wasn't looking, and then look back at them, and then you would just like get into this flex, <laughs> flex on them, and then be like, "Oh, you got me, flexed on me." And uh, we just kind of started to run wild. I mean, I start to like when I take like a joke, I kind of usually take it too far, but um, so it's not like a. No, it's not like a flex. It's like you're it's looking. It's not like a shrug. Like no, a, it's just like you're just like. You're in a pose. You're just in a pose, just holding <laughs> like strong. Like a Schwarzenegger flex. Yeah. yeah. And like it's mostly between me, T-Bird, and Huggy, and T-Bird would just be like, God, oh, you got me. Ruined my day. Like <laughs> lost all confidence. I got to go home. Like I can't even work today. Like it would just like ruin, ruin people. So um, I got to the point where like, I mean, one time I like. There's a studio downstairs in the old snowboarder office, and there was, like, a bunch of baby oil because we, like, I don't know. Like, we we were, like, shooting <laughs> models at the time. Like, they like Surfer what? Magazine was in the building, and they'd, like, they'd lube up the girls. And I don't know. Like, we just had a bunch of baby oil, so I just, like, lubed up my abs. <laughs> Came upstairs and, like, went into T-Bird's office and just, like, lifted up my shirt. I'm like, oh, yeah. He's just, like, fuck, flexed on me. <laughs> and... um then it started. Then it went on to be like this thing that we printed out. We printed out like a little fl- photo of um, the Top Gun character slider in the volleyball scene. Just like that's like the classic flex pose, and just with his shirt off, <laughs> playing with the boys, just lubed up. <laughs> and we we had this little piece of paper, and we would like hide it places, and you like open a drawer, like God damn it, you flexed on me. <laughs> Someone put it like in my um, in my uh, in my gas can door thing so like when i went to go fill up my gas it fell out like ah, got me it's like getting iced yeah it's like it's getting like nice like yeah. and, but and like yeah, yeah and it, the, like this and huggy was all about the slow joke he's like i'm all about the slow joke like it might take you like a month maybe two maybe a year <laughs> to get it Huggy's a but genius. it's gonna be like it's gonna be good um so we it's just kind of escalating and like it kind of fall trickles off and we stop doing it all of a sudden, Huggy's like, dude, come in my office. Come in my office. He's like, I'm going to get T-Bird a subscription to Flex Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is going to be the ultimate flex. 
<laughs> and so he gets like their address from Lauren and gets it all set up. And then <laughs> Lauren's like, one day Lauren's like, hey, um, did you get a new subscription to this magazine? He's like, no, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he pulls out the Flex magazine and he's just like, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's just like the ultimate flex. But the, the on the flip side is like, he actually started reading it and he liked it. And so <laughs> like, he actually like enjoyed getting the Flex magazine for the next 12 months. Mm. He still yeah. gets it. Yeah, jokes on you. I like the Flex magazine. He's, he's, yeah, and he's still a subscriber, apparently. That's incredible. Didn't yeah. you guys do the exercise ball rolling stuff? That was like, more like Huggy and Big Mike. But yeah, he, ball surfing. Ball surfing. Yeah, yeah. we'd like gather up, like uh, when, when the office was kind of dead, maybe on a Friday when like the surfing magazines are dead and like everyone's out surfing or whatever. And like Snowboarder was always kind of like, I want to say maybe like the hardest working crew in the office. Granted, it was seasonal. We'd be gone all winter. But when we came back to the office, we would like put in our time. But like everyone would be gone and we'd gather up all the bouncy balls that people sit on for like at their desks and like line them up and like do ball surfing, like just (laughs) run and like skip across the whole thing. On your stomach. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was more of like a huggy and big Mike thing, but (laughs) kind of went viral, I guess. Mm. Yeah. What was your what was your position at snowboarder? So when I first started, which is this is insane, I was the associate photo editor, which like definitely doesn't exist anymore. Would never exist in this day and age. But like back then, I think it was 2011 when I started, and it was just like things have gone like I just like had maybe like my tenure had just run out at K2. I was like not really like super stoked and wanted something fresh and bridges approached me about this job and um again they wanted somebody with product experience shooting product and like now i had that so i was like damn like i do have that but i was at first i was like "Ah, i don't really know i'm not really a socal guy i don't know if i want to do that um and then i thought about it and i was actually on a trip with bertner and like i was like damn dude i think i'm going to just take this opportunity because like just seems like a great opportunity to learn a lot about like publications and print and also to like, I mean, Huggy definitely dangled the carrot of like, dude, you're going to get published more than any time in your life. Like you're going to get covers, you're going to get spreads. And like, that's definitely like, for me back then, that was pretty intoxicating to like make a mark, you know, and just like further that a little more and be more like tied to it. So I started as associate photo editor and that was just like basically like they didn't really know what I was supposed to do. I was like I was like making videos and shit. Like I was like interviewing people and making videos. I can't remember what the videos are called, but like I would just film them on like my 5D, like the most horrible audio. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh and then I'd shoot all the product and then I'd also just like help Huggy and learn from him like the ways of how to become a photo editor and like the processes of like And processes that, like, I still use to this day as far as, like, organizational stuff to, like, really hone in and, like, just gather all the the imagery. So, yeah. That's incredible. Do you Have you ever tallied up how many covers you got? Not that many. Not as many as you'd think. I think it's maybe, like, 14 or 15, somewhere around there. But it's a good haul. I mean, there's guys out there that have, like, hundreds of covers. Like, I wonder, like, Andy Ride or, like, Scott Surface or even Zim, like those guys are, those guys are doing it in the heyday when there was a lot of covers to be had. With Snowboarder, like, um, we were all trying to figure out where we fit in because, like, the staff started to grow and we started to level up, and we were starting to become more of a. Um, I mean, it was, I hate to say it, but it was like it definitely was like either Transworld or Snowboarder, you're like one or the other. And it's like kind of pitted against each other. And we weren't owned by the same company like that happened like more recently. So like it was something where we were just like kind of going back and forth. And like Transworld definitely had the upper hand, you know, like um, as far as like their web presence was like insane. And they did like a really good job with like um, cultivating like brand. I don't know how to like say it, maybe like, I guess I would say it as like snowboarder was maybe for me, like snowboarder was maybe more for the culture and Transworld was more for the brands. Like Transworld would lean into things like 
um, like team shootouts and stuff like that. And like a lot of product based stuff. And they're like elevating the brands, which is like awesome. And we had our own lane. We, we were like leaning more into like, we're going to do super park. We're going to bring everyone together. We're going to do the launch. We're going to like bring all these young kids together and like elevate them. We're going to do miss super park. We're going to bring in the women. And just like that franchise is like kind of like the saddest part of the demise is that like brought a lot of people in and like elevated them and gave them a platform to like thrive. And that's kind of like, not really as existent now and it's kind of like fend for yourself like build your own brand we can't help you yeah well, we can but there's like, nothing like super park anymore yeah no i mean i'd say holy bully is the closest <laughs> thing True. to it um but it's 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 a different it's a different franchise but completely different objective as far as the snowboarding goes yeah totally like, there's nothing that puts that like there's no moment for the up-and-coming kid that's truly up and coming that mm -hmm. hasn't gotten invited to peace park yeah. to like chuck off a big jump in front of the entire world. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the launch was like a really exciting one for me because, um, just bringing in all those younger kids, man. Like when I was in, in the mix, it was like lick the cat crew. And it mm -hmm. was just so sick to see mm -hmm. like, you know, Blake Paul and the Warbingtons and just like Sage and Michael Wick and like, all those kids like come through and just like that camaraderie that was like those kids met there mm -hmm. and they just like went on to become lifelong friends and mm -hmm. just like their snowboarding exploded and it, it gave them so much exposure and camaraderie like that just gonna last a lifetime so mm -hmm. like and that that's across all the boards with like super park and the super park mm -hmm. soup like amazing events to be like it was a lot of work and like definitely like you know, some, some words to be had and a lot of stress, but like totally worth it. Oh, totally. Um, yeah. A lot of injuries. A lot of, <laughs> dude, a lot of injuries, <laughs> man. But the launch was one of my favorite. Cause like these kids are made out of rubber and they're just like, they're just sending like, mm -hmm. um, and then Miss Super Park was awesome too. Just cause like the fun factor, man, these girls were having so much fun and we were like a part of that, you know? So, um, I don't know. Somebody bring that shit back. Yeah, but <laughs> totally. But like moving forward like with my job title it was just kind of like kind of a, a jack of all trades you know i was helping out with photo editing and shooting product and it moved further into like helping huggy and just like we we're just trying to make the sickest mag possible you know and just like staying in contact with all those photographers and just like that was just such a insane thing opportunity to have to have like a hard drive land on your desk full of Oli g's photos from the entire year Woo. And like, I'm talking like, you get to see the outtakes and like the funny shit he shoots and like, it's, it's a deep dive. It's a deep dive in like what a real pro does. And I learned a lot from that. Like mm -hmm. I learned a lot from, um, I mean, in early years I would like reverse engineer photography and like the guys who are like, I couldn't figure out how they shot that photo. I'd be like, damn, that's, that's my guy. And like Oli G, it wasn't like. I couldn't figure out how to shoot his photos, but I couldn't figure out how he like pulled so much lifestyle and like humor out of like his shit, man. It's mm -hmm. like really special. Yeah. And so like I got the behind the scenes look of everyone's photos and it really made me a better photographer because I got to pull from all sorts of people and just integrate like all that knowledge and just all that like wit and humor. And it just it seriously elevated my photography. So like, in that sense, I grew a lot in them. And then moving forward, once Instagram came around, like I was qu a quick identifier of like, we need to do something with this. Like, this is gonna be huge. And like, this is our chance to like, actually put our flag in the ground and like, actually be a contender as far as like, trans world's always gonna be ahead of us. But like, this is our opportunity to actually like, beat them at something. Um, not that that was like, the goal, but like, it was always like a fun competitive thing to like think about. And, um, yeah, I, I, at one point, Laura Austin was working at snowboarder and, um, she was running the Instagram, but it was like very like, I don't know, just maybe like one time a week or something. And, um, I'd kind of like had this weird mentality, like anybody who's friends, friends with me on Facebook, like in the, 2008 to 2010 it was like a chronological feed right 
And I was just like, I just like to make people laugh and like fuck with people. So I would like just flood my feed. Just like, I remember that. I would just like <laughs> write gibberish, just stupid one liners. And, and it would just like clog people's feeds. So every time they were on Facebook, it's just all my shit. <laughs> like <laughs> hundreds of things. And like people got angry. Yeah, like, they- <laughs> I was like, because it's like not only your friends with like your friends who maybe get it, it's like your friends with like family friends who were like, ah, you really like blew up my Facebook feed. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, um, and so like I kind of took that mentality and I was like, I'm going to see if I can do this with Instagram because Instagram was chronological at the time. And so I was like, hey, Laura, and like I asked Pat, I was like, can I just like take over the Instagram account and just start like just going to ham? Like we have so much imagery that's just not even being used. And like, I just want to see like what we can do with this thing. It's like a totally new platform. Nobody knows like what it's about. Like a lot of people weren't even on there. And so, yeah, I just went in and like, I spent a lot of time just like curating it and like just taking like Oli and Eastone's photos and just blowing them up and just like blasting it out there. And we started like just steamrolling, like just followers. It was insane. It was like, I don't know, like 5,000 followers a day type shit, like 20,000 a week. Like we just started gaining and gaining and gaining. And like, I remember at the time Hondo was working at Transworld and we were always like chatting friendly and stuff. And he was just like, dude, you need to chill out with the Instagrams. He's like, cause he's like my direct, but he's running the Instagram for Transworld. And um, he like <laughs> came up to me at a premiere at one point. He's like, dude, you need to chill out. And like make me my job like really hard. Like this is like not cool. I'm like <laughs> I was like, sorry, man. I'm just like trying to run with this shit. You know, I see an opportunity. So mm-hmm. like, but how, it was. How many followers did you take it from? Do you have a sense of where you started and where it ended when you were running it? I yeah, I started probably at like 15k and I took it to a million. <laughs> and that that was just my goal. And it's just like that's crazy. It's dude. not even like. It seems like stupid now, like to think like, oh, I really wanted to grow an Instagram account, but it was just like, it was, um, at first it was really fun. Then it kind of just didn't really get fun, yeah. but we figured out like the pre-posting stuff and could just like load it up and like not be hands off. Mm-hmm. I think um, you figured it out and told me and I used that forever. Yeah. And I told Jeno, he used like a bunch of people started using the same one you were using. Yeah. So I was <laughs> yeah. always kind of trying to stay ahead of it and like. I don't know. It's not like some accomplishment and I'm like, holy shit, look what I did. But you sh- <laughs> should be because like they that asset that you drove yeah. is there is continuing to make money for that Absolutely. Right, for that title for that name. So oh, that's all it is. Basically. It's all it is. And it's yeah. like all that like sweat equity that you put in. Yeah. For is sure. What is now lives on. Yeah. For sure. And like, I remember when we were hiking Hero Zone and we got the first thousand like photo on the snowboarder account. Yeah. <laughs> you just, yeah. I think it was just a cell phone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was just always like putting stuff out, but it was like. Like those little like things back in the day seemed like. Early like Wild Wild West of IG and you're like yeah. trying to figure it out and the. Yeah. Like, we hit a thousand. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> yeah. and, and I mean, like, things have changed so much. The algorithms have gotten so tricky. But mm-hmm. like back then, it was pretty cut and dry. I was just like, you just got to post and just mm-hmm. like flood the blog. Flood yeah, the blog. clog the feed. Clog the feed. I used to do like four a day on LibTech. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a lot. And then Dave would do like four a day on GNU. It was just like we were just flooding the block, you know. Four days were hitting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man, going back to a couple things, just want to rewind. Like, I think, A, going back, A, you breezed over, you know, the launch. I was just thinking about the amount of kids that have kind of on the show that gone on to be super pros that have sat in that chair that have been like, the launch kickstarted my career it is really fucking cool. You it's know? so cool. And, and like, yeah. kudos to Bridges for like, yeah, absolutely. Thinking up all that stuff and like, yeah, man, he's still fighting the good fight. And oh, I'm like, I give, I give all those mags so much support and as much love as I can and try and help them out. And like, it's cool now from an outsider's perspective, now that I'm not in that magazine world, like, I don't know if I want to be in it. It's a challenging field, but mm-hmm. like, um, from a cultural standpoint, I still see the value and Absolutely. I like love what those guys do. And like, I'm stoked to get the mags and like dig in and check out all that imagery. 
Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Uh, and then, you know, you were talking about Huggy the whole time. And the thing that just keeps coming to mind is karaoke, you know. Yeah. So you've been to Japan uh, many a time, as we all have here. And aside from Silk, Silk, you been? Nah, that's on the list. We'll though. have to take you there, Silk. Those yeah. glasses, that haircut. He would thrive. Oh yeah, right in. Harajuku. Drop this kid in Harajuku. <laughs> yeah, drop. He him. literally looks. Uh, you know, Joey. Joey B, how you doing? Sent me a video of a K-pop artist that is uncanny to Silk. So I think you could look like a celebrity when you're there. Yeah, I'll drop that footage in now. Yeah, drop that footage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, going back to. Uh, karaoke, you know, when you go to Japan, there's bars, there's karaoke bars. These things are awesome. You're usually in a back room. Everybody's drinking sake. Uh, you, you're well tenured in, in karaoke. Who's the, who's kind of like karaoke goat of the crew? I mean, it's Huggy 100%. Yeah. Yes. Like Ryan he is, yep. he is just, uh. I love that dude, man. I mean, he you're is, good too, though. I'm good, but like he has that passion and like McCarthy he's, too. McCarthy, yeah. Like Bridges gets in the mix. Mary's really good. Like T Bird will get in the mix. Cabin event, like occasionally we'll get in the mix. He's got a couple go tos, but like for a while there, it was me and Huggy just feeding off each other because we would be like, we would be like in the office, like practicing, mm -hmm. like ready to take it to like. There's a um, restaurant actually we went there with you at one point it's called taco it's a sushi restaurant they have mm -hmm. uh karaoke seven days a week so yep. like in cycle many we could we could like do it up any day of the week and that was like walking distance to mm -hmm. our house so huggy's like a borderline like he almost has a karaoke like problem <laughs> like he's like an addict yeah like at one point yeah he <laughs> was <laughs> like it's a healthy addiction yeah. though. yeah for sure <laughs> well i mean it comes with a little bit of some booze and you yeah know. that's true so. What's, what are your go-to? What do you normally hit? Uh, I'm kind of like a NBD. I like to kind of rotate through like first try stuff, mm. which is kind of, That's I got a tough. big running list. Yeah, and it's kind of tough. You know, I bomb a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really do it to like crowd please. I will not throw on like, you know, just that classic, like girls just want to have fun stuff. Okay, yep. Um, but I think the last thing I sang was um, at a bar in Oceanside called uh, Larry's Beach Club, which is, has karaoke seven days a week. Um, shout out, Larry's. Yep. Uh, I sang Bush's Glycerine. Mm. Oh, wow. That was a pretty good one. Not a crowd pleaser, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Cleared them out. Cleared them out, maybe. <laughs> but I, for a while there, a go-to was uh, um, Chop Suey by uh, System of a Down. Oh, I wow. I guess people going. Wake and up. uh yeah, <laughs> I could see yeah. that being really yeah. good. Yeah, yep. it's got a are lot you of deadpan delivering that. Are you like staying true to to system of a down? Or I'm pretty it? deadpan usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, but you know, like what's if your, I have a, if I, a wake up, like what's it? And what wake up? It's trust in my <laughs> self righteous <laughs> yeah like oh, no, yeah we get into it like in a little there. vibrato yeah, yeah, like yeah, you got vibrato the, yeah going. close my eyes deep. and feel like i have a fat goatee you going got the arms <laughs> like, wide just open a fatty right just there. like graded goatee yeah. yeah and you know i did have some i did have some creed that i want to visit but i mm. i actually practice and it's like really freaking hard they hit their yeah 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 so yeah that's good stuff wow i once went toe-to-toe -to -toe with dangler on a on a boss song, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Mm. Oh, pretty tough. Mm. Uh, yeah. but we pulled it off. Wow. I, I gotta wonder silk back there is a musical genius. A, a lot of people call him the songbird of our generation. Silk, uh, if, if you ever get in there in karaoke? I'm actually not a very big karaoke guy. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I think cause I make my own music and have done performances and stuff. Like I want to, I want to put on a, a good mm. show with, some passion and and karaoke is just kind of like for shits and giggles and i i don't really well you're kind of karaoke in your own it. music when you're playing it technically we gotta we gotta <laughs> get to the top of the charts before i can start doing shit like that yeah okay <laughs> yeah true <laughs> everybody uh follow silk days on uh spotify if you're looking for some absolute heat yeah 10 um, out of 10 recommend 10 out of 10 dude, i'm gonna check that out yeah yeah good stuff God, love some love some karaoke. Well, Mike's also uh, proficient with the uh, guitar covers, and you used to do. Uh, oh Ka yeah, Kesha and. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a musical. Yeah. So well, on, also like on another tip, like um, 
Huggy used to actually like host his own karaoke night. And um, dude, shit used to get kind of crazy. <laughs> At like a local bar that we like knew the owners, like Thursday nights, I think, he would host his own karaoke night and the whole snowboarder crew would come down and we would like just get obliterated. And we kind of had to stop going because we were like, dude, we have to be in the office the next day. This is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Huggy kind of ruined us for a little bit. Oh, that's so good. I uh, I keep thinking of this um, uh, song Bodhi always carry karaoke's and it's Enrique Iglesias no that's what I do I oh, do oh, okay. I usually do Enrique Iglesias because Bodie's really good he has that really? yeah he's got a nice voice hello hey Bodie what's the song you always you karaoke at like Pete's that you that had me dying um not Enrique Iglesias no it's like the yeah, you hit the yeah. it's like R.E.M. or R.E.O. Speedwagon or something? <laughs> Those are pretty different. Pearl Jam? Yeah. Which song was it? Remember? Um, Pete's House in the Basement. I told you you should ride to it and karaoke your own song twice in a row. Back-to-back text messages. I don't remember. Oh, the, the, one, they, the one Week by Bare Naked Ladies? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Here's Bare. One Week. <laughs> yes, that's it. Yes. Dude, that's it. That's it. <laughs> It's one week by bare naked ladies. Oh my god. <laughs> That's a horrible song. Yeah. <laughs> we got Yosh we got Yosh in the booth here and we're talking uh karaoke and I was like, Bodie says this one song, it's incredible. And I was drawing a blank, so I just did a phone a friend who wants to be a millionaire hey. lifeline. Uh <laughs> yeah, cool. Hey Yosh. Hey buddy. Um nice. Are you interviewing Yosh? Yeah. He's we're Great live. Interview. We're live. You're on air. Oh, I'm on air. Yeah, can, can you we, maybe hit like the it's been one week or whatever? Can you just hit us with a little it's bit of been ba- one week since you looked at me? <laughs> your head to the side and said, I'm angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. Damn. Voice of an angel. Wow. You sound like a mix between the- Jesus and Fergie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. We just needed that. Uh, by the way, I'm still going to push for you to karaoke your own video part to Bare Naked Ladies uh, one week. All right. We'll talk about it. All right. Later. You can imagine that being a good character, just the first it, few lines. He had there. a lot of flavor on that. Yeah. Dude, he's got, he's nice. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like he's nice with it. Yeah. He's yep. nice with it. Yeah. Good stuff. Let's talk, uh, let's talk Soy Sauce Nation. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Soy Sauce Nation. I mean, I'm affiliated. Uh, it's more AK, Nirvana, and Max Tokunaga, who are the, um, the founding fathers and mothers. Um, But yeah, I mean, I first met AK just at the trade show, um, at SIA trade show years back. And um, he came up to me and he was like, dude, I love your work and I want to give you the sticker. And he just handed me the Soy Sauce Nation sticker. And I was like, dude, this is cool. Like, I don't know what this is, but I'm backing it. It's just like, it's. I mean, it's a celebration of just like our Asian heritage, right? and it's funny, like, what can happen with a sticker because, like, it's it's just, like, there's an idea and then there's a sticker and then who knows where it can go from there. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2020, they wanted to pull, put on a full-on event and gather some Asian snowboarders together and just, like, it's not a competition, but it's just more of, like, a community-building aspect and um yeah it popped off man like it was like it was really cool to see like um a different feeling than normally going snowboarding like i'd like attribute it to maybe like the first time i stepped stepped like foot in japan and like looked around and like everyone looked like me and like just that feeling but then going snowboarding is like something really special that like you can't really put your hand on it it's just like it just is it's just like something super special so like um i'm super thankful and i like um we've gone on to do like three four more events uh this past one we did two this year one at boreal and then also one um at the snow dome over in jersey and that was more of an all-inclusive like bipoc event and lgbtq plus um inclusive event um 
And yeah, it's just been so sick because like my snowboard community before Soy Sauce Nation was like, you know, like a lot of homies at Mount Baker um, and then pro snowboarders, kind of like a pretty tight knit group, not like a broad range. So like it's been really refreshing to be able to like go out and meet all these Asian snowboarders. We have these connections. They like, you know, they already know me from my photography and they're, they're stoked to meet me. Um, and so I've been able to meet all these people and grow this community that like just wasn't there before. And I just didn't know I needed or didn't know existed. So, um, so AK has brought me on to be like kind of the staff photographer. And, um, one thing that's like super important to me that I learned from like snowboarder events is like, we always like when people are registering, we always shoot portraits of every single person. Like just every single person deserves their shine, like in a certain way, like maybe they're not doing the craziest thing in the mountain, but they have this like really nice portrait of them just being themselves and they can like share that across their platforms or whatever. And just like, just showcase that, like, you know, just how beautiful like an Asian face is. I know it's like may sound corny to say, but that's just like, we're all beautiful in our own right. And like, I think we should be proud of that and be able to like share that. So like, it's so cool to see. Cause like I take these photos and like, they just end up like immediately across the board. I see on social, like they end up on people's like profile photos, like every single one of them is like <laughs> using one. So it's super sick. And like, I don't know, it's, it's really fun. And I'm, re I'm really thankful. Like those guys have put that together. Cause it's like, kind of an NBD and like, just like something that I never knew I needed. But like, now that I do have that, it's just like, let's do more of these and like, let's include more people and just like make people more comfortable, like coming out snowboarding and like doing your thing. So fucking rad. So rad. Man, it's cool. Snowboard's in a cool spot and with that. Yeah, fucking, for sure. So it's like, it's such a good cool you know it's like you, you you think about you're like damn like snowboard mags went down what a special thing that was but then like so i saw station they like it's it's this ever-changing beautiful space and there's always that just makes me happy for snowboarding with stuff like that it's fucking cool yeah for sure i love like seeing like all the different levels coming together at the soy sauce nation events yeah where you'll get like some of these just absolute savage beast mode Japanese rider pros. Totally. And then you'll get like, you know, all the spectrum in between, like Pika will be there yeah, doing her thing, you know, and uh, like our friend Bong from Juno will show up, you know, and <laughs> like bust a front three or something. Like you just get like, it's just rad to see that yeah. big of a spectrum mm -hmm. joined together and getting, like you said, like shine put on them. Mm -hmm. Like, for like sure. All of them get a Yosh headshot and like you might f end up in the gallery on, on a <coughs> website or you're going to get in the Instagram post and there's a group picture. And For sure. And it's like, I mean, I know you've talked about it on the show and it's, there's a lot of talk about visibility, but it's just like, dude, like it's so important. Like, like from my background, like I grew up Japanese in like a pretty like predominantly white space and like pretty predominantly white 99% white <laughs> yeah, yeah you being the one that wasn't <laughs> yeah i mean can talk about token asian that was like me and like it's like um growing up i just like i just didn't know if i could fit into like the snowboard thing you know i was like i don't know like i was really t tiny and i was just like I, physically i'm just like tiny I, like i don't know if like i don't know like i want to snowboard but i don't know if i can do it you know and then like um, there was snowboarding on TV and it was Brian Aguchi. And like, that was a moment. Like my mom was like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw Brian Aguchi on TV, half pipe comp. And my mom was like, that's a Japanese name. Yeah. And that was validation for, for from her for you, you know, also. Yeah. I mean, 
it sounds like so stupid to say that like like just because you're a certain type of way that like you don't you can't do it but like i kind of almost believe that for a second and like it's just crazy to think about like in this day and age because like visibility is everything and like if i'm i'm just so thankful to have had that and like um yeah i mean i just want to be like super visible and like look to let other people know that like you know it's that's it's just not it's not a thing and it's so stupid to think about because like you look into like um how it is now and you're just like the japanese guys are the sickest snowboarders like out there right now and they're like the most stylish and like the sickest to hang out with so it's just, like such a funny thing like in your head that can just like formulate um but yeah visibility is everything i mean like but it wasn't like that when you were growing up no i mean so it wasn't that's, at that's all, where you it wasn't formed. at all like yeah. so it was just like dude brian aguchi man like that was like really a heavy moment for me for sure yeah they called him the spin doctor it was like this it was like a half pipe comp somewhere i don't know maybe it was like back east or something but i remember there was like butterfinger banners like all along it was like all butterfingered out it was probably like the tdk world championship yeah maybe maybe and he uh, yeah he was the, he, they were just like there he is the spin doctor sick like brian Gucci. like yeah it was like really sick moment for me yeah i mean it wouldn't have been until like rio that you really got like another mm -hmm. example yeah like it wasn't i mean no there, i mean there was like guys like travis yamada and like alistair schultz and like you know there was yeah there was others out there but it was like it wasn't like it is now and like just to see like where the japanese guys have taken it like is so sick because like you see raibu um out there and he's like he's like we have to try to go twice as big i'm like fuck yeah he's like and we have to try to be twice as stylish that's their mentality yeah. they like have to work like they feel like they have to prove that and it's just like it's just so sick to see them take that to that level and like watching a Yumu ride too, man. That's just like, I mean, there's just no one else like him. And he, and like I always try and make it a point to like go up to those guys and like speak Japanese to them when I see them on the mountain because I know they appreciate it and like um, they're probably like think I'm a kook, but whatever. It's just like I just have to do that. No, dude. Yeah, yeah. those guys, they're so gangster. Dude. So gangster. They're, they're so fucking gangster. They go so big. They look so good in the air. The best was that dude tour when Ayumu put down a fucking crazy ass run, and somebody, whoever the on, like on the ground interviewer, like right after his run, goes over there. Ayumu, like, can we do an interview? And they got the camera and everything and the mic on him, and he just goes. No. And he sits down on his board. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> dude, you're like, this dude is so fucking gangster. Yeah. Just like, nah, I'm good. You're not interviewing me. Just yeah. wearing the next level, like, yeah. most gangster Uniqlo outfit. Like, We actually got a guest question in regards to this from none other than Mark Clavin, known for some blurry photos at times. <laughs> Here we go. What's up, Yosh? A uh, quick one here. Which current pro has your favorite pair of pants in snowboarding? Um, and, yeah, maybe uh, when you're done, we could just get a little grandma kiss into the mic. Have a good day. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man, I love Clavin. That guy is so special. Um, yeah, I mean, a Yumu. You just got to look at the pants, dude. Like, can't get enough of those pants. They go over the entire boot. <laughs> like, if he's just standing <laughs> static, like not hiking, the pants go over the entire boot. Just, like, put put that into perspective. But going back to Japanese, go twice as big. Uh, so Rio Tahara was worked for Solomon when I rode for them for a long time, and he, uh, that's a, that's a full-blown thing. I remember him saying, like, Japanese riders, they have to go twice as big. It's like, that's, like, yeah, the, that mentality. That's the mentality. Yeah. Like, like there's no half stepping you're like gonna go huge mm -hmm. yeah so and in in what way do you think he meant that like 
we push ourselves to do that or in order to get noticed in order to get noticed by yeah. the US mm -hmm. by North America we need yep. to go yeah twice as big yeah. yeah no I mean it's totally true you know it's like it's so easy to say you know that Japanese writer mm -hmm. and not say their name mm -hmm. it's like why not just learn the, it's not that hard to learn the name you know mm -hmm. it's like it might be different than our names but like I just noticed that kind of thing mm -hmm. still yeah. to this day, you know? I mean, it's kind of probably the same for a lot of, like, the, the Scandinavian writers, yeah, too. And, I mean, yeah. those guys go huge, right? Totally. Like, and it's it's harder but to I mean, get recognized. Yeah, when the whole yeah. industry, like, not the whole, but majority of brands are in North America, and they see, you see the next kid riding the mountain you're riding, Big Bear or Brighton, or and all the people that work for the brand are there, they're going to be the ones that are in their peripheral. and But it's... uh. Certainly makes for watching fun Japanese snowboarders with insanely good style. I remember we were there thanks brain year, our first ever trip, and mm -hmm. uh, we were on the groomer at I think we were on Hokkaido, and we had and these guys came ripping by, and they were laying down just the nicest carves, and they were like some of this pack that like handcrafts their own high backs and like like their kits were different like everything was dialed to this level that was like so much more than what we were bringing to the equation you know for sure and i think the guy like there was like a side hit and one of the guys like back five did like groovy like everything you wanted you know like edgar's you know style carving to freestyle moment just happened in front of us and we were just like this place this is the future of snowboarding. Like, how could this place not take over snowboarding? Like, I had that, like, thought that long ago. Like, dude, these this culture, they love culture. They live for the minute details like we do, but they also just excel physically in a way that is, like, crazy. Like, whatever, like, however they're grooming riders over there is – and, and maybe it has something to do also with trying to break through, but the recipe, whatever is making the recipe has been like a swell that's been coming for a long mm -hmm. time, you know? Yeah. And it's fun to be here and watch it crash, you yeah. know, like over us. Like, yep. dude, for sure. these guys are so sick. And in skateboarding too, it's like. Oh, mm -hmm. skateboarding's like so next level right now. But it's so rad because they're bringing so much of what I cherish with them. Yeah. They aren't, they didn't abandon it and become robots. Yeah. Like they are bringing style and culture and like doing the trick, the hardest trick, the best it could possibly look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like not only am I going to do a trick you've never seen, I'm going to do it so fucking mm -hmm. good looking. It's going to blow your mind, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's aesthetic with the performance. It's like, whoa. For sure. And it also, you mean, t talking about like slept on, have you ever shot with Takahiro and Nakai? You know, from from a distance, I, I was actually oh, like working at Hood when yep. he was um, still like a half pipe champion, mm -hmm. um, and so like yeah, by default I did shoot him like just on the sidelines. But like, I mean now he's like a powder god. Mm -hmm. He's still and, ruling. Um, yeah, he's still ripping. And dude, like, got to hand it to Tadashi Fuse as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, he is just like I got to go on a trip with him like years back and he was just still at the top of his game mm -hmm. and um yeah it's funny because like um i was shooting with him in kazu and i was like damn dude did you see that he's like just muscled that landing and kazu just looked over at me and he was like tadashi is like gorilla <laughs> i was like <laughs> i was like okay yeah i get it i get it now dude yeah yeah fucking look at kazu man too holy shit what dude a just a just a, like a generational like phenomenon, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. Man. So uh, you got to go on a trip with both those guys. Y yeah, this was an epic trip. It was uh, Kazu, Tadashi, and Gigi. Whew. <laughs> yeah, and it was just yeah, watching those guys do their thing was so fun. Yeah, legendary. And and speaking of Soy Sauce Nation at at Dutour, uh, what's the name of the young girl that I think she won and she's like a baby, Patty. Patty, dude. Yeah. Every it's over for for everybody. Like Patty, yeah. Patty is the future. Like it's it is over. It's Patty's world. It's yeah. give it We're about give it, it like three three years. 
it's over for everybody besides Patty. She's yeah. get, she's gonna go on like a Sean White type of tear. Now I got something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. And the charisma too. She like is, yeah. hams it up for the camera and is just like so freaking funny. Yeah. Like, yeah, love Patty. Mm-hmm. She's the best. Cool. Well, uh, moving along here. Uh, you know, we do have to talk about the fact that, you know, I get, I have an X Games gold medal. You have you have one as well, right? I think we won the same year. Yeah. And Jesse, do you have one? <laughs> Oh, you don't. Okay, all right. Okay, I, just, I was just making sure. I was <laughs> anticipating <laughs> this. <laughs> you know, it, it is nice having one, isn't it? So I didn't go to the X Games. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ever win because I was never there. <laughs> you never went to the X Games, though? No. Nah. Like, competed in it? Because nah. I feel like early years you probably... I mean, you need to advance Triple Crown and all that, that kind of stuff, too. Yeah. But. Well, I, when I got, when I won the Triple Crown, I would have gotten invited to the Big Air, but they canceled the Big Air and only did Slope Style. Mm. And since I didn't win a Slope Style contest, I didn't get invited to the mm. X Games. Mm. All good. I mm. would have choked for mm. sure. Wait, you didn't win a big air? No, yeah. I did. You did, yeah. You, you but they the canceled cabin? the big air. It was like oh, okay, okay. X Games cut the big air. It was like yeah. years there was no big air. Because I remember that was the cab nine double grab. Yeah. Toe pop? Duh. <laughs> stupid question. Stupid question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I watched yeah. that on TV. So can you cut that stupid <laughs> question? <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> yeah, I watched that on TV. That was dope. That was fun. Beat out Rippy. Gave, gave AK props in the... Uh, in the uh, celebratory interview. Homie's cooked. Yeah, homie was cooked. <laughs> homie's <sure>. cooked. <laughs> so how did you how did you come about this medal? This, yeah, this so glory, it's, where, where, is your, where is your medal? medal? Where did you? Are where you, you wearing it? Well, funny you ask. <laughs> no, uh, it's just for, like on a shelf gathering dust somewhere in my mm. office. But um, but yeah, it have, was. At least you have one. You know. It's uh, it was uh, yeah. They used to have this photo contest with. X Games were like you well at first it started out as like a monthly like photo thing where you send in a photo and if they run it they pay you and they pay you like pretty good like definitely like comparable to like page rate for a magazine if not better um and so they started this thing called that that turned into like a contest so like the best photo from the entire year would get entered into this contest which would compete at the x Games. so they'd pick like three of the best photos of out of the 12 months and so yeah i think it was the first year they were doing it they picked my photo along with two others um and yeah i don't know it just did really well just well received with like the public i guess and everybody voted on it it's like a public vote and um there's a shot of jake blavelt riding this big ak line like kind of getting down into some spines and stuff but um but yeah that's how that's how i won it and um kind of like the easiest x games gold medal to win ever mm. probably mm. but we had like a server farm gone in ballard <laughs> <laughs> just voting on that thing around the clock now to train did you go did you have like a training regiment you know a lot of athletes when they're getting ready for a big competition they do like some training did you have like some like you were just kind of like doing some finger curls to get just the, get like a rubber band on there and just really <laughs> <laughs> working on timing. Yeah. I actually did injure my finger though. Oh, you have my a pho- trigger- photography injury? Yeah, yeah. Oh um, wow! I got landed on uh, years ago at oh, a Miss Super Park. Um, Taylor, I was in the wrong spot. Like I shouldn't have been there, but um, Taylor Elliott uh, was sliding across. Oh, she God. she was like redirecting into a wall, but one time she just got on top and locked in on top and mm. just slid the whole thing and just like it's on my social go go dig for it it's pretty awesome we use like when the bodies hit the floor you know. <laughs> nice yeah maybe we can insert it if i can find it <laughs> i found but, uh, it it's in there yeah it's a yeah. little, little insertion <laughs> yeah. we'll do an insertion but yeah pretty good one i could definitely like dodged a bullet on that one but for some reason my finger was the only thing that got really mm. that's really your money maker yeah so i did go to a good hand doctor mm. Um, shout out to Cora and Encinitas. Mm-hmm. They um, they fixed me right up. I didn't have to have surgery or anything. They were just like, I had it in a splint, and he the doctor was just, take that thing off. 
just like move it. Mm. Just keep moving it and it'll be fine. So was that J D Pruitt or I don't remember who it was. Yeah. Did did you uh how much money you win for the X Games? Um ten G's. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Woo! Oh my god. Yeah. And I think that was like that was around exactly the same time when I got let go from snowboarder, so it was a nice just like okay. Little fake you know what you want to do with that metal is you want to put it in like your guest room. Mm. Yeah, there so you go. Anyone that's staying over, you know, yep. they have to confront your greatness. Yes. yes. That's what we do at our Airbnb. All my trophies are in the master bedroom of the Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I learned that move from Barrett and Temple because they have a guest room that's just floor to ceiling, Mount Baker, Bank Solemn duct tape. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's a bit of an alpha move. Yeah, it's an That's alpha a move. sick move. Because <laughs> yeah. you don't see it into the house until you get into your guest yeah. room. And you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. These guys are amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How'd you like the decor in the guest bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Pendleton blankets. <laughs> wall it, it is. You're like sleeping on the Pendleton blankets. <laughs> duct tape going yeah. up to the ceiling. They, they got like a storage unit out back for that. For the act. They rotate. For the Pendletons. Yeah. They yeah. like to rotate with the storage yeah. unit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys are from AK. Is it a snowmobile or a snow machine? Snow, snow machine. machine. Okay, it's a snow machine. Yeah. I feel like you guys are more credible than us uh, lower 48ers. So you nice on the snow machine, Yes. Not necessarily. No? I mean, there was a time when I was nice, but it's been a minute. But um, yeah, I can hang. I can mm. get to where I need to go. I'm not one of those guys that's like rooping. Okay. I'm just trying to get survival mode. Get to the zone, find an angle. Post up. Mm, find an Angus, if you will. Yeah, little Angus. Yeah. So how was uh, how was it the first time you went to Whistler with the big dogs? The big dogs. Yeah. So, I mean, this is years ago. This is um, probably 2006 uh, when I first started heading up to Whistler, and I had bought um, I bought Lando's old sled. It was a uh, kind of a piece of shit but and it wasn't a piece of shit it was just like the technology was a bit older then so it was like an o2 rmk 700 which for the for the layman's it's like a boat it's very wide it's not easy to turn and um the handlebars are low and the track's not that long so kind of have a lot of things stacked against you but um yeah the first time snowmobiling up there um i linked up with arrow and mikey and um <laughs> Those were my guys. Um, fuck back then. Those those guys were probably like in their teens, but they were seasoned. What zone and, were you in? Um, we started in. Um, we started in um, Callahan. Oh, Callahan. This was before Callahan was closed off. You came up the Callahan side. We you came up the Callahan the around, side. Yeah, and it was so easy. Like <laughs> you're taking a lake, and it's just like. You're going up through single lake to single track, lake to single track, and then boom! All of a sudden, you're at like Hollywood Cliffs, and mm-hmm. like you're at some like heavy hitter stuff. And like I could recognize right away. I'm like, damn, we're here. And like, there's just a stark difference when you get into the Whistler backcountry. Like, I don't care where you go, like where you sled, but like something about the Whistler backcountry. Like you just round that corner in a chocolate bowl, or like take the S shoot up and just see like the form step down for the first time, and just like it's like, wow, I've arrived. And like, it's just a feeling like there's like something really special about those mountains there. I mean, Washington has some great, amazing mountains, but like that's that certain like sea to sky access is none other. And like, I don't care who you are. That's like the top tier. And it's like, there's a reason why like there's been um, so many people filming there year in and year out, you know, like the goods are there. So, but yeah, I got to shoot with Mikey and Arrow and man, was it a learning curve? Like, you're just holding on for dear life and you got this heavy backpack on and it's just not easy. You know, you're, you're get, you're digging out on deep days and like, granted I'm with some really good sledders. So like they were really cool about like holding my hand through that and like teaching me and like be like, Hey, maybe just chill here and we'll go break trail for a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, like those types of scenarios. Um, and you're just like, yes. Okay. Good idea. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, cool. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea, guys. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> you know, like as you go through it, like you start learning the zones and you start, you, your sled starts, you get the upgrades and like you get more comfortable out there. And there was like a time uh, and place where I was going up there a lot because like Bellingham's a really great place 
to access that. Like there had been days where I would, we knew it was just going to be a one day w window to a warm up, and I would just like drive up at four in the morning, hit the trails, we'd go up and shoot, kill it, come back and go home in one day. And so like um, that access is like something like there's just not a lot of like people still pro snowboarders living in Bellingham, but like it's like really good if you're an American, you want to still live on the side, you know, ride Baker, train, whatever, and then go um, film in Whistler. So yeah, the whole snowmobile journey was been has been so fun, like learning the whole way. And then like up until like my the end of snowboarder days, like Mikey was like so gracious as to like invite me into his home and like, you know, like throw the sled on the back of his trailer. I would just use his loner sled. And like, he just like, he was an awesome, like just mentor in that way. And just like looks after everyone. And, um, and he just loves seeing me eat shit. He just loves it. <laughs> yeah. Like at one point I was like, I had like, it got off the track. I lost my sled. And I was just like watching my sled go down into like, we were, I think I was going up the gauntlet or something and mm -hmm. just watching my sled going down. And I'm just like, and it's like at the bottom, it's like Devin Walsh and Chris Rasman and like, you know, the man boys. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going to kill one of those guys because I like, and then I'm going to total his sled and like, and then I get up to the top and Mikey's just laughing at like <laughs> the loudest cackle, like just like, dude, that was awesome. <laughs> and so I just love his like, his humor and like, um, but yeah, I mean, I had a lot of really great days with Arrow out there um, and like whoever he was filming with a lot of people days with Sean McKay and well, McCarthy. Well, let's talk about Arrow's landing average, dude. Oof, yeah, He's Arrow's at like 90, 90, 95 percent. Arrow is a problem because um, he really had to keep. I really had to be on my toes to shoot with him because like there was a lot of times where you only got one try. Mm -hmm. um, he would land everything first track a lot or like first try, um, and you just really had to be on your toes. So like a lot of times shooting him, we'd have to have a remote angle going with on a tripod just so like just to cover all your bases, you know. Maybe like you get the more tight end angle with your with your long lens and then shoot like a, or more pulled out one with on a remote angle just to like, and that, that happens a lot in sledding. Cause you can like, you're just doubling your money. Right. Or like doubling your chances of like really nailing it. Um, but yeah, arrow is definitely really consistent and lands a lot of stuff. So you just have to be on it. And like, if I got like two or three tries with him, I would be stoked because mm -hmm. like he was always doing something crazy and you can always like count on, lining that up so good style such but. a good switch backside spinner mm -hmm. yeah for sure talking about aero niemala mm -hmm. not etala just for yeah for the yeah people Definitely. nice clarification good context yeah good job. but I, I don't know what i'm I don't, here for kind of a natural <laughs> i don't know if you remember but um we sledded together in whistler at one at one point when i was with mikey you were with uh trans world year oh that was like my first year the whistler back in yeah i don't even really remember I don't even really remember that time. It was you. Did I grenaded my sled up the S chute. <laughs> Were you there that day? <laughs> yes. What do you mean? Oh, my God. I forgot about that. I got to the very top of the S chute. It was my first time to Whistler, top of the S chute, buried it. And I and I remember Arrow came down in a panic because he's like, dude, you're in a fucking heavy like, slide pass zone. And, all, like, and he got me. And I basically, I don't remember what happened. He just maybe rode my sled to the top because I was almost there. We were close. Or he rode it back down and rode it back up. And I hiked up. Yeah, but, you, you were close. I remember just like, like right by you and your eyes were just super wide just like stuck at the top of the shoe. Yes. I was like I can't stop sorry buddy <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> so scary, I forgot though. about that yeah 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 that was a fun day you guys hit a step down like step down and then like Sammy like hit it and like it avalanched oh oh okay I fuck it it all kind of blends into one big blur of mad whistler vast backcountry yeah for sure i it, mean that's it, it that was your first yeah that was my, time i don't think i landed list. anything that day because the landing slid right yeah yeah yep i forgot about that holy shit yeah good times man it's so fun going there with mikey too because you just like you you get on the snowmobile you put the horse blinders on you follow him for like an hour and then you're just at like the chicken coop or like the dopest zone you've ever seen. And it's just, it's yeah. amazing. He's got that place down, like so dialed. Is there another generation? I think Mikey Cicerelli and those dudes and like the, um, 
a, like uh, there's a, there's a bunch of younger kids, uh, Sean Miskimen that that are like the next wave, but underneath kind of Mikey and them, I'm pretty sure. And they're yeah. on, they're on sleds a lot. Yeah, they're from, yeah. they're ripping. Yeah, but it's kind of like nothing like it used to be because, I mean, back in the day, it was like when even when the Callahan was open, it was like so many crews like you would see two forum crews you would see people crews you would see Mm -hmm. whiteout films because that's when i started shooting with mikey narrow it was whiteout Mm -hmm. um yeah and it was like it was busy i mean there's there's something for everyone right but it was like it was definitely like a spectacle Mm -hmm. and like it was definitely like i was like starstruck just like like, oh, it's Devin Walsh. Yeah, you can look over <laughs> and you, you'd see Devin hitting something. I yeah. remember we were watching somebody hit diesel drop one day on our way back. Or, yeah. Yeah. Somebody's hitting the form step down when you're heading out. Or, yeah, it's such a iconic. It's an interesting thing from a photography standpoint to think about your wide array of shooting where you link up with Stevens and you're shooting like maybe a, a bench at a park and he's putting in 150 tries and you got all day to find a good, get a photo out of that. And then vice versa, you wake up at four, you snowmobile all day for Arrow to end up on the top of the step down, and you have one moment that's the moment, and you can't fuck it up. Yeah. You know, it's like, you better be on your shit for that Whistler stuff, but they're both technical in their own right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's like such a sense of freedom and um, just empowerment of just being out there. Like, you, you like, you start like just pinning it across like a Rutherford Glacier, and you're just like, dude. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I am out here and mm-hmm. like this is really cool. So mm-hmm. like yeah, I mean I just like encourage all like Crazy photographers adventure. and just mm-hmm. like yeah, follow that adventure and like yep. also like like don't be afraid like it's scary. Yeah, but like don't be afraid to try it mm-hmm. and like you'll be like surprised like how rewarding that can be. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny to think back on some of the best times when you go to those Whistler Mountains like I've been out there and blown up my sled at like the bottom of this like huge hill climb this garbage pile jump and we have to tow it up three big faces and then out 20 miles and that sounds horrible but like yes. some of those experiences of having to figure out how to hook two snowbills together to tow a snowbill out and it's going wrong and it's a shit storm like you look back on those memories you're like damn that was a full-blown event like a life adventure survival oh, yeah. situation and yeah. that, that's really fun even though it sounds like a shit storm it's like looking back it's always really fun yeah and it gives you that confidence of like damn i could probably do almost anything you yeah. know if you could make it out that's like mm-hmm. those are some serious situations sometimes it's like it's serious so you mm-hmm. definitely have to be smart about your shit and be on it but like yeah just like make it home you know mm-hmm. so absolutely i was trying to think that's funny you brought that up because i'm like i don't know if we've ever sh- we'd ever shot I, I actually shot with you at Baker too that same year. Oh, get real year? The yeah, trivial, because the step down. Uh, <laughs> there, there was a step down that you guys hit, and then it didn't never even. I don't even know if anyone was filming. Okay, I don't remember because. But and there was a tree. Of course, there's a tree thing that little tap spin. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, Stevens the, hit. St- yeah, Stevens yeah. hit. And then you hand planted the tree. Fuck! Don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send. I'll send you the photos. <laughs> God, we've been. It's been. It's been a couple lifetimes ago. Yeah. It, it really it's has. Been. Kind of fun to talk it, old war that stories. Was when Scott ate the brownies. Oh, oh my God, that yeah. was when Scott ate the brownies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When he didn't think he was ever going to come back. No, yeah. I don't know, man. I just, I just looked at the knife and I just had to get away from it. I just had to get away from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we won't give any more context to that yeah, story, but yeah. we'll save that one. Shout out to Gary Milton, another AK legend. That was at Gary yeah. Milton's house. Garylos, Leggy. All right, it's time to get into the pub beer crapshoot. We got dice somewhere around. Oh, right there. Grab those two goon gear dice. Mm, nice. Now, it's time to roll for some cheap, fun beer presented by Pub Beer. No matter what you're doing, cracking open a pub beer for cheap fun is always a safe bet. Now, you just got to roll that dice. I'll tell you what you got to do here, Yosh. Okay. Three. Oh, that's bad. three. This is a good question. What would your house party entrance theme song be? Damn, I don't know. Let the bodies hit the floor. Um, maybe the final countdown. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> nice. great, great choice. Maybe T Pain. <laughs> <laughs> what about Akon and Young <laughs> You used to have like a T Pain app on your phone. I know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they make that anymore. Mm, I am T Pain. <laughs> <laughs> 
Go, go on. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> and would you, would you enter the front of the party or would you come in the back? Mm. Mm. You ever mm. do the sneak around back? I'm like, I've been here all night. I like that back entrance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit all of more of an that. observer yeah. vibe. If you'd rolled a two, it, what, what would have, have happened is said, Snake Eyes, tell us about a time you went number two in your pants. Ooh. Let's just do all these questions. Do them? Um, <laughs> I mean, not very. <laughs> Not very like exciting. I just like sharded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's like in the car, and I sharded, and I was like, oh, <laughs> "Gotta go, gotta go somewhere." <laughs> Through the underwear, and just kept going. All right, yeah. love it. Okay, covered it. Yeah, covered sharding. That's covered good. my underwear and <laughs> feces. Sharding. Chat. Did you see the shark yeah. department in the back? I did. Yeah, it yeah. smells horrible back it there. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the shark department. Mm-hmm. You know, all of our like we have like business emails. Like we're kind of like pretend business bomb hole. But it's like they like their everything is titled shark department that comes from that back room. So nice. All right, we're gonna get into hot takes now. Hot takes is presented by Oakley. I run the Oakley Mod One Pro helmet. It's uh, I got about four or five brain cells left. Trying to keep uh, trying to keep those things in there, and then uh, I run the Oakley Line Miner helmet. But they got some exciting new innovation for their Mod Three helmet. Excited to check that out. That's supposed to be their hot new ticket helmet item, and they're dropping the new team collection outerwear. Um, so that will be coming soon. So be on the lookout for Oakley's new product. Again, I run the Oakley Mod 1 Pro with a line miner. The goggles are good in any light. You can't go wrong. Uh, so let's get into hot takes presented by Oakley. Now, the first question we like to ask is, uh, you know, if you've seen The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan or the goat of snowboarding, both male and female, who you got? Hmm. I mean... For male, I have to say Terrier. Um, just his just pa- raw power and just competitive aspect, and also just um, just the cat like reflexes. Like he is just the epitome of like a powerhouse snowboarder. And he competed for a long time. He never stopped. He's still he's still boarding on the rags, from what I can see. Um, and yeah, man. I just I I do have a special spot for Terrier in my heart. Um, he uh, we didn't always really get along. <laughs> He's kind of a dick to me, but um, <laughs> but um, got a Terrier's a dick to me story. <laughs> yeah, but like no, but he came he came around and like I tell you what, like um, he uh, last year I got all my shit stolen, all my photography gear just jacked, like in Seattle, like car smashed out, like all my shit jacked and like so i posted on my instagram like hey i lost this stuff like if anybody knows if they can see it um i lost this camera and this camera and yada yada and the first guy who hits me back is terrier and he's like i have that camera a little contacts t2 it's like super expensive he's like i'll give it to you so like that's gang i have a special spot in my heart for terrier that he like you know maybe we didn't always get along but like when I was down, he was like there for me. So thank you, Terry. I really appreciate that. As far as like uh, women, man, this is a hard one because there's so many amazing women. Um, but I'm gonna go have to go with uh, MFR. I like. Uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know her through like working at Arbor the last little bit, and like. Um, gotten on the gotten opportunity to travel with her a little bit and she is just like the gem of a human and her writing is just like next level as far as like um what she's put out and what she's about to drop i think that she is the epitome of um an altering beast like she can do it all so like yeah mfr great That's answer. exciting we're gonna see some new footy well i I I mean I don't even know really. Allegedly. I'm just allegedly. I mean, I hope so. Yeah. Um, Every time she puts something out, it's gold. Yeah, I think um, I was looking, saying, looking for. I I don't know if she's actually filmed anything, but I know she's going to film more stuff in her career. So. I love it. Um, okay, I got a curveball for you. Ak goat. Ak goat. I mean, it's got to be burner. Mm. No. Like. Present company excluded. 
I mean, dude, you can't really like Gary Milton. You can't. <laughs> Gary, Gary's up there, but you can't really like deny um, the passion, um, the progression, and just like the influence. Like this guy right here has like influenced everybody, present company included, and like brought everyone with him. And like not even asking for anything in return, just like you make your mark and like that's all I'm asking for, you know, so. Um, and then just the videos, dude, like 20 video parts, like pretty much no one can say that they've filmed 20 video parts. And then the influence of all those video parts and movies like collectively, like it's just like endless. So like, yeah, easily the goat. Mm. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. Sir. Yeah. Okay, another Homer cur- goat, though. <laughs> Homer goat? Kobe Linden. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I wanted to get to. Yeah, for sure. Okay, snow- guru. snowboard photog goat. Um, I would have to say Dean Blotto Gray is... Mm. Um, he's my guy. Um, I think that um, just over the years, through the generations, Dean was like... I can't even call him Dean. Sorry, no, Blotto. Like, I don't even know who Dean Blotto is. Blotto was like the first. <laughs> I'm just trying to. Dean? <laughs> I just try and give him the shine of like his whole name, but like because he introduces himself to strangers as Blotto. Like I don't always introduce myself as Yosh unless like I know it's somebody like tied to the community. But like, um, but Blotto is just. I mean, he like, I don't know. He just like kind of defined a whole generation of like, um just like out of the corner of your eye like angles and um his work with burton was just so prolific and then moving forward he's so supportive of bringing anybody else into the community and 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 including them and myself included like he helped me like um he had a photo show at like in the early 2000s and he invited me out to shoot his photo show And he was like, this is the mag you should send the photos to. This is a great contact. Like, and like helped me, like he just mentored me a little bit, you know, through those years. And now that we're just like peers, like it's insane to see him like evolve and he's still shooting photos. He's making like insane art and putting out publications and yeah, he's the goat like easily. Love it. Great answer. Is snowboarding an art or a sport? I think it's an art. Um, I think there's aspects of it that are a sport. And I think that like maybe there's aspects like competitive snowboarding that's more considered a sport, but I think there's an art to all of it. And like, I mean, you consider like even like finding a spot, like that's an art like building a spot that's an art and then also just like trick selection and just like progression like there's these things that don't that don't translate to like a normal like stick and ball sport or whatever you know it's like very unique to like what we do so like it's definitely an art yeah that's a good point because where you choose to take it that moment is pure art for sure and like yeah, like a contest rider, they build the jump for you. So there, maybe there's like less art in that. But like how you like set up your turn and how you do your rotation and like there's a huge art to that. And like it's really cool to see like just the differences of the way people ride, you know. Mm-hmm. Well thought out answer. I like that. Who's the most underrated in your eyes? Oh, man, this is a tough one. Um, I think... In, like, powder snow, I think for me it would be Matt Edgars. Um, I don't think he got the shine that he um, could have got. I don't think he necessarily even wanted it. Um, I think that um, his edge control and just the way he approaches the snow is just something almost like Craig Kelly-esque, but with, like, his own twist on it. Like, he's got something really special, so, like, Definitely Matt Edgar's and then like I mean I do want to add one in for street that um Johnny O'Connor is just like Ooh. I just like can't believe like he's not 
still a pro snowboarder or maybe he is i don't know but like i just like see some of his clips and they're just timeless and he just goes huge and like every time it looks like something that's like death defying almost so a grades only yeah uh steel or powder powder 100 percent. favorite style ever hmm I mean, I'm going to go with Devin Walsh just because I've just like, there's just something so beautiful about watching him just do a frontside 360, like maybe not even grabbing and just how like just compact and like powerful and still he can be. And then um, also like style and the way he like wears his clothing. Like, I mean, I've talked to you about this, Jesse, like, He's the type of dude that like never wavered. He he didn't like skinny up when it was time to skinny up. You know, he was just no. always like boom, like big baggy pants, baggy jacket, like and the tricks too, really. Like. Yeah, and the tricks like he didn't. He never really had to. He ne- you never seen him spin like over like seven usually. Like, like sometimes a nine. First but. time I ever saw him was barfoot at switchback one eighty. I think yeah, a gap and it was like switchback one eighty for the next. Like, just with more and more style and, like, mm-hmm. sicker locations. You know? Yeah, like for sure. And just, like... Translate, like, yeah. Yeah. Just such a sick dude and, like, amazing pioneer. Like, mm-hmm. I don't... Re- who knows what the Whistler backcountry would be, like, filming there without, like, guys like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, really sick to see. Great answer. A favorite method... I mean, it's got to be Jamie Lynn. Um, I just like, dude, that was like, he, like, it's just like, you, you talk about like those, those people that just have that one trick and they can just do it. It's just like, it's like Reynolds has that front side flip, you know, and you got to lean into that. And cause like people want to see you do that and it just never gets old. And like, I've got, I've had the privilege of shooting with Jamie and like, I've had the privilege of like shooting a method of Jamie. And that's just like, dude, that's a huge like thing to check off my list. Um, side note, I've also got to sing karaoke with Jamie in Japan singing Neil Young's heart of gold. And that was like, (laughs) that was like, I mean like humble brag, right? But like, dude, like that was like, you know, for those don't, that don't know, you got to watch the garden, look that shit up. Mm-hmm. But what, that um, wasn't after the bully, was it? That was, yeah. We were all together. Oh yeah, you were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. We were all just singing along, like yeah. It came on and just like the place went crazy, and I don't then we exactly just exactly like, remember what songs were sung. I remember uh, that one. <laughs> yeah, it was a yeah. Yeah, we were on one. Yeah, and I think <laughs> then, yeah, we were on one. Then we had to run from the cops, but you know that's another story. At the fish market? Mm, I think we just had to run from the authorities because we, like, broke everything in the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Allegedly, <laughs> we should say, for legal purposes. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, your your favorite snowboard video ever made? Oof. Please say thanks, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got to go... I got to say robot food after bang. Mm. So, sorry, Jesse. No. Actually but an like correct answer, but yeah, so maybe <laughs> might be an incorrect answer, but like, <laughs> yeah, that video just like, just the the watchability and like that in that in that time period, it's just like there just wasn't something like that. Granted, mm-hmm. they, you know, they took they took Optigrab and took all the riders and just trans put their twist on it, mm-hmm. but like it was like such a sick twist at a sick time where everything was so serious in snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we needed like something just a little th- little just to loosen up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it just came at the right time with the right people. Um yeah, and just Travis Parker, man. I I think that's Dude. the best video part ever filmed. Travis Parker is man, that's one of my favorite snowboarders for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, great great answer, well articulated. It is interesting just to st- Think about it really. I've never heard it put in context. But the year before is Optigrab, same riders, totally like one's a great video, the other one's a like culture shifting video. But it's yeah, it's kind of like crazy to think about like what standard was thinking like 
what are we going to do? Like they took all the riders, mm-hmm. right? Like, but yeah. you know, it's just, that kind of happens every once in a while, but on that scale, that was pretty gnarly. It'd be interesting to hear the real story. Yeah. Cause we knew like what the, the whisperings were, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but for like, sure. It seemed like, yeah, you took that whole mix and then Joey Fountain and Louis, the creative, just putting the robot standing in front of the silo was enough Dude. to take that whole mix and just tilt it to like genius level, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. just that little difference where you got like this cardboard robot, mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like it's not that big of a concept, but no. like just enough to like, be like yeah. sky's the limit. Well, and the music choice and like yeah. the, the, oh, the athletes, yeah. like mm-hmm. the way they filmed that was just, it's just something special. If you think about it also too, the mixed mediums, were just so incredible because I, if I'm referencing like Travis Parker's part, you have a digi clip of a guy backflipping into a tree landing on his head, followed by a 16 millimeter super pro cab nine nose, mm-hmm. followed by buttering on hard pack, followed by it spinning. It's like this, it was the perfect blend of lighthearted and like super pro A grades. Yeah, for sure. Know? With great music. And that, cra- and that crappier footage brought, brought audio to the table, which yeah, is like everything exactly. back in the day with the top level videos was like a lot of 16 with no audio. So mm-hmm. it like brought so much flavor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great observation on that. Um, okay. What else we got? Oh, this is a good one. Favorite board graphic. Hmm. Burger box scratcher. Or <laughs> Favorite board graphic. I. I really had I was really partial to um Brian Aguchi's uh pro model on Burton. I think it was only out one year. But it's like Ouija board? No, Ouija board was um Evil Twin. Okay. Right? Or or the twin. This is like maybe four <laughs> years later and it was like um baby blue um base with like a guy like a kung fu guy. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was sick. I I, th- I don't know if it like actually got released or if it was a limited release but it wasn't like super prevalent yeah um but i really like that one for sure mm. i thought you were gonna say the parker must go one. Oh yeah yeah well i mean i have that one right yeah like that's classic that one and then like i don't know the um the tarquin shotgun is definitely iconic mm-hmm. yeah um i had that board this that was like my second board so aggression aggression yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, dream sponsor. Dream sponsor. Is there any like I say constraints? No, I, I say no parameters. Jesse's got parameters. <laughs> I always have parameters. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Yeah, he's got parameters <laughs> on his own, but we'll, for the sake of this conversation, he, you know, for example, Silk said the U.S. Mint. I think that's that would be yeah. out for me. Yeah. So, yeah. but that doesn't meet me. Jesse's. Per, what are your parameters? The, it's keep. It's in the spirit of the question, like. It can't be just like free money. Or like <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think it can be. It's like it's like when people ask like, "Oh, make a wish, like a million wishes." Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't do that. Like, yeah. yeah. It's one of those um, type of deals. I'll, I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go uh, Channel Island surfboards. Hmm. Just because, wow. like, wild card. I, um, yeah, I'm not in that world. I love surfing. I'm not in that world, but like, it would be so sick to get free surfboards. Mm. All right. Silk some U.S. Mint. Uh, let's yeah, just go, I'm sticking to it. Let's go around the horn. <laughs> uh, I've said Home Depot. Uh, Jesse, what do you got? Spindrift. Spindrift. Ooh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Smart. That's dope. Smart. <laughs> That's yeah. a good one. Uh, what would yeah? That just currently un- spending about seven bucks a day. <laughs> so. And they also they <laughs> always come in like eight packs and they're gone before you know it. They've done yeah. this like. Can they just make a cube? Can we get thirties of these things? How yeah. do we make it happen? Okay. All right. What else? Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, if you go heliboard and three people, good times, how turns, who are you taking? Oof. Kind of already did this. I, I, I know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I ended up uh, shooting some photos for Eagle Pass back in the day, and they were like, we can't, we can't really pay you for these photos. And I was like, what about some heli time? So I was banking some heli time, and last year I went up with Pat McCarthy and we, we shredded our faces off like early seasons Eagle Pass. Amazing. Um, <laughs> so sick. But no I would throw, camera. yeah, no no camera. Um, I would throw, um, man, it's it's hard not to throw McCarthy in the mix because he's just like e- the ultimate purveyor of Stoke, you know? Um, one of my best friends. So got to have him in there. I think, um, I think I would bring my dad just to kind of like 
show him what it's all about. I think he would just be so enamored in like what we do and like he just has such a good appreciation for nature and he would he would love that. Is he and ski or snowboard? He has skied back in the day, yeah. But he's pretty old. I don't think he's doing anything on snow these days. Yeah. Um Yeah, and then the third, um yeah, I'll just bring burner. Just get him in the heli. It's <laughs> a good that's a good chopper. Yeah. Good banter on the headsets and yeah. that. Heli. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I like if the that. powder's dry and the the beers are cold. <laughs> 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 and the banter lively <laughs> yeah the banter is flowing like let's, the salmon of the capistrano let's make I'll, it happen i'll be there yeah <laughs> eagle pass if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> so who if you could bring three people heliboarding presented by eagle pass <laughs> 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 if you're looking to get a heli <laughs> if you're Dude. listening to this yeah ryan runky let's get on the line let's make this happen <laughs> okay uh, next one we got uh, beaver slap. You know, are you are you a slapper of the beave in the lift line? I should say for context. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. I I'll, I'll take some snow off the old old board, but I will say like, just don't like skate right up to the line and slap it on the thing that the the lifty has to like sweep off every time because mm-hmm. that's kind of a dick move. So are you save also- it. Wearing that stuffed animal butt pad thing? Is that are you into that? Yeah, for sure. I got about three or four of those <laughs> on the yeah. on the bottom. What characters? <laughs> well, I got the turtle for sure. Yeah. You know that one's front. The and turtles center. a go to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you got your turtle on. You're doing beaver slaps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice. It's, it's a full uh, like a a mutant ninja turtle mm. costume actually. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. I like that. Notice like the turtle's wildly popular in Japan. Yeah, on slope. You see? Yeah, yeah, for like, sure. Well, like, kind of any little cute animal, they can just like yeah, work it into any product or. They're all over Snoqualmie now. Oh, the turtle. Yeah, different different ones. Yeah. Oh, not oh, just the for like slow just, down or no, like like the, for your butt the butt pad. Yeah, oh, like the butt. Fall, oh yeah, the butt. Yeah, on your stuffed butt. Animal, it's like a stuffed sure. animal butt pad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, you'll see like you'll see a bunch of them on the Greenhorn. Mm. Yeah, which I is see. where I ride every time. Mm. I see, I see him down at Mountain High. All right, last question for worst trend is uh, or for the hot takes is worst trend. What do you got? Worst trend. Um, I think um, maybe just like being too quick to assume. Um, I think like in our communities and like industry, like I don't know, people like talk a lot of shit and like um, you know present company company included like i'm trying to be better at this myself but like you hear a friend like talk shit on something and you're just like yeah you know like fuck that that sucks but then like if it's a person or something like maybe just take the time to like meet that person in person and make your own decision you know and like same goes for like social media too because like people can like really just while out on social media but you meet them in person and they're like totally different Mm -hmm. person so like i don't know just trying to be kind to one another and just give give people a chance and just be don't be so quick to assume you know mm-hmm. wow great answer all right well we're we're almost there you know we're almost wrapping up we always like to ask uh setups you got a, a setup behind you a board with two bindings on it um <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is the setup that you're repping back there well i got my uh arbor this is my brian aguchi satori um it's kind of like a short fat um Resort Ripper, it's a super fun board, and it's a great board if you're lugging a camera bag on your back. Um, and then I'm running the, um, I'm running some Arbor bindings. I think these are, these are the Hemlock. These are the Cypress bindings. Um, yeah, bindings plural. There's two uh, of them on there. Cypress <laughs> binding. Um, I actually don't what's, have a lower binding because what stance is that? It's, <laughs> We'll do, a, re- we'll do a, like a 28. <laughs> what we'll exactly do a little reveal. There's thoughts? only one binding on this board because <laughs> I was too lazy to put on yeah. two, and I knew that <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would be hidden behind the uh, behind the uh, the, the table, table here. Yeah. But um, Movie yeah, magic. Yep. Let's see, like 23 in the front, usually the zero stance. in the back. Uh, stance is usually 21.5. 23 zero. Maybe 21. I don't know. Yeah. And pretty angled. I mean, you're pretty angled, right? I not as much as I used to be. Yeah. Knee knee problems. What what's your what's your Angus? It's probably like 
Yeah, maybe 21, probably 18. Yeah. Let's go 18. I think that negative, sounds negative three to six. Yeah, I like to go zero on the back foot and then zero forward lean. What's um, up with all photographers being really good at carving? That's a good question. That's all we can do. Get this heavy bag on your back. Like it's like you have such a nice carve. Zim has an amazing carve. Um, I don't know. There's more of you out there. Yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of us like Oli Ganya. Well, Oli's good at everything. He's a legit ripper. <laughs> he's he's board slid the red ledge. Yes, like, yes. That's just like. <laughs> <laughs> but how's his car? He's, he's got a car. Oh, he's yeah. got a car. Yeah, yeah he's got super fan. good board control. Yeah, he's 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 running way up there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think just like having a bag on your back at all times, you're like going to see that wall hit come up and like maybe I'm not going to hit that because if I bail, I'm going to fuck up my camera but. I can do a mean carve, mm. so maybe something to do with that. Okay, killer. I like that. Well, we also we haven't really talked. We talked about your stance, but what's your stance? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think at the biggest, my stance was probably twenty three <laughs> inches. <laughs> and this is talking like <laughs> jeans days, like back in the nineties. Yeah, that's what but, we are talking. <laughs> yeah, some base, is... baseless bindings. Like yeah. I was stomping some shit. You might have been a twenty four back then. Mm. 24.5 uh, was was uh, I, I was in 20 Granger hit 24.5 I think he might have gone over 25 at one point I think he did damn yeah, 25 I think he went do his t-bolting boards to get the ultimate stance <laughs> yeah anybody that knows about that knows well for, why don't you explain the difference between a stance and a stance for the layman you maybe this is I mean that's more show. of Burtner's yeah but you're I mean you're involved Burtner I mean you can take this one if you want well, I mean, I think we covered it before, but yeah. Know, anytime you get a little wider, you gotta just like the word stance. The wider you go, there's more A's <laughs> in the word, right? So it true, true. Stance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good. I see one out of the corner of your eye. And stance. Yeah. You know exactly. I've yeah. seen some at Mountain High. I've seen some extreme stances, and oh I think a God. lot of it is attributed to like maybe like a channel system that's not screwed in tight enough, <laughs> and then like. <laughs> And hitting a big jump and just boom, like all the way out, and and then it's like no care in the world to like bring it back in. Well, I'm you, I, I'm not shitting you. Like you that's, gotta wonder with some of these board builders, like the option, yeah. to go like twenty eight or something. You're like, how is this on this board? <laughs> yeah, someone's gonna take that option, and they do. Yeah, you're like you know what? I like a big stance. <laughs> I like to man spread wherever I go. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is nothing more glorious when you're going up a chairlift and just you off in the distance carving down. You just like holy shit! <laughs> yeah. Look at that stance. Yeah. That thing is raging. <laughs> yeah, stance is a it's a beautiful sight when you see it out in the wild. Yeah, love a good stance. Then there's the stints. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, was that like eighteen inches? Like, yeah, it's like. Tyler Verajan. Yeah. <laughs> That's like Jed Anderson, uh, like like pre get real. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got it all, dude. Yeah, that's Bring good it on. stuff. All right. So uh, what's next for Yosh? What do we got on the docket? What's going on these days? Um. Yeah. I don't know. Like as far as what's next, like work wise, I'm uh, doing some work with uh, Arbor Snowboards, and then also um, this brand, uh, this this company, pretty great. Who, who does the marketing for Bonfire and Sessions, and um, we also do a bunch of different like um, turn into kind of an agency to where we're handling all sorts of different brands through like golf to like lifestyle and um, bags and all sorts of crazy stuff. So working um, a bunch with those guys, and then and then freelancing a bit trying to get out there as far as like um as my time allows like you know um trying to get out and freelance as much as i can so um coming up uh hoping to get out with nitro circus i've been working with those guys a little bit oh cool um oh, yeah don't you have like a beaver nope. beaver fleming connect oh yeah i know beaver yeah <laughs> yeah you know beaver <laughs> no oh no <laughs> <laughs> you do <laughs> yeah yeah beaver is awesome man he's like such a nice dude and like i mean i don't know those guys super well but he's like he's the mega ramp skater okay yep. and he'll do like all the crazy yeah. like what's his thing kickflip backflip uh backflip finger flip i think backflip finger flip mm, yeah yeah wow. so super fun working with those guys and um melnick love, line love that up those. yeah melnick's been awesome like one. love that guy um he's all it's funny because like i came out last year and shot a show for those guys and um 
he was like, dude, you haven't, did I have you shoot a show like in the past? And I was like, no, that was my first one. He's like, damn, like you really killed it. Like for their first time, like a lot of times people come out and just completely blow it their first time. So like, good job. And then, like, I don't know, I test like um, that stuff to like snowboarding. Like it really prepares you to be like ready for almost anything. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so, but yeah, working with those guys and then like I got a couple other brands um, on the horizon hopefully and um, yeah, a couple of book projects as well. I'm gonna, I wanna put out, um, I'm working on like a actual like hardbound book project. Um, I haven't really got through like, I'm kind of in the edit phase right now, but like um, I'll just give you a little teaser. It's like this, it's nothing to do with snowboarding. It's this um, this character I met in Oceanside. His name's the Oceanside trench coat guy. Um, he's like this older guy in his seventies um, who got um, melanoma cancer. And his doctors told him like, you can never go out, like never go out in the sun again. And he got super depressed. And um, then he found out, he was like, I'm just gonna wear a trench coat. And he's just like the staple in, um, in the Oceanside community. And he's just such a charismatic, funny guy. And I've just formed this relationship with him and we go out and shoot photos. And he's like one of the super interesting, sick people to shoot with because he will do anything for the camera. Nothing's like off limits. And so like, I've just gathered these insane images of him just getting war. His thing is like, he'll, he'll wait for the highest tide and go to like the edge of the water and just get worked by a wave. And, uh, <laughs> and I just have these insane photos of him, but definitely check him out. He's a character. Um, he's on, he's on the gram Oceanside trench coat guy. Um, and then I also have a couple like zines in the works too, with some snowboard stuff that I want to put out. So, um, yeah, man, I just want to keep pushing that stuff when I, when the time allows. And like, it's just such a fun outlet to like go through all photo, all the photos that just aren't going to go anywhere. Like photos don't deserve to live on hard drives. Like let's get that shit out there. And mm -hmm. like, also like, um, for all those photographers out there who are like shooting a ton of film, like I see a ton of people shooting film and like putting out some really sick shit. Um, but yeah, like take the time to like print out those photos and frame them and like gift them to people and like get them out there because like, dude, like they just like, if you're spending all that time and money on film, like do yourself a favor and like just print out a really sick photo and just like look at it and relish in the fact that like you created that, you know? So mm. amazing. Great, great wise words. And also everybody check out Mike Yoshida.com. Cause like, it's such a good gift for somebody. You print out a, you know, a, a zine that's for somebody that loves snowboarding or a, a iconic print of something and you get it and you frame it and you give it to somebody. It's such a cool, it's a great gift in this day and age of like a lot of, shitty stuff you can get on Amazon. So I think that's uh, really cool. And then uh, one last question I guess I have for you would be, you know, for the up and coming kid or somebody that wants to get into photography or specifically snowboard photography, do you have any advice for that kid? Yeah. I mean, man, the landscape has changed so much since when I, when I started getting into it, but like, I would say just like, yeah, like just be observant, like, um, just really like take a minute to like take in your environment and, and, and observe the things around you and like figure out like what is really intriguing to you because like there's so much stuff going on in this world that's like so magical. And like, I think that like, we really got to lean into like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to focus on? There's so many things you can shoot photos of. And um, yeah, so like focus on observing and like focus on like what you want to do and then just focus on also like making connections and like figuring out, like meeting people at these companies. Like, Hey, I want to be a snowboard photographer. Like I want to meet like this, this brand manager. I want to meet this marketing manager and like start connecting the dots because like that community is like everything. And that's how you can like really connect, um, to a lot of different people and also a lot of different jobs and just try and be kind to everyone because like, you just never know when that, kid is going to turn out to be your boss someday or be like the brand manager or the team manager or like the product designer and like those people can get you ins all over the place so like definitely like pay attention and like be kind and just like just keep working and like 
just like always like have a backup plan. Like maybe it's not going to work out in snowboarding, but damn, are you good at shooting lifestyle? Like follow that. Like snowboarding's not always like the end all be all. And there's always going to be something else that you're going to need to fall back on and like, like hone your skills. Like for me, it was like the product photography thing, you know, like, damn, like if all this stuff goes away, like I can chew product, you know, how are you going to make yourself useful within a crew? How are you going to make yourself useful for a brand? Like, um, yeah. And like little things, you know, like for me, like cooking is like such a passion and, um, you know, every time I go up to Arbor, I make a salsa and I bring up chips and salsa and I'm just like, try my new salsa and everyone's super hyped. And like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's going to help me get my next contract. Maybe not. But like, I got to share something with something. So like share things other than just like what you're good at and like what people expect of you. And I think that can go a long way. So. Damn, dude, I love that. Dropping knowledge over here. Yo, sh- that's fucking awesome. What the last thing we forgot to cover before we get out of here? The Yosh sticker. How did the Yosh sticker come about? The think thank Yosh. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, that's all Jesse, really. I, I mean, it was so the Yosh head, this sticker, is basically it goes back to Kazu Kitayama, who was like air blaster, photographer, slash, slash mascot. mascot slash hilarious just friend who came over to High Cascade from Japan every year and we all hung out with and Air Blaster made this shirt with just Kitayama Kazu face just nicknamed Jizzo huge in the negative like that with the Air Blaster logo with the Air Blaster right where the think tank one is and then we were just like we gotta do that for Yosh <laughs> So it's kind of a joke and a bite at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but like it's kind of it's taken a it's 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 a tribute and it's but it's taken on a life of its own because like I have people asking me like hey like is it cool if I bite the Yosh sticker and I do that for like a brand or like something and I'm just like dude it's not my idea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's like pretty hilarious like the life it's taken on and like Do you still have a shirt? I still have one, yeah. I have like a couple like choice tees that like I just am hanging. I have my like patchwork patterns shirt. Wow. I have my uh, stack footy shirt. Like yeah, a couple we, choice tees. We you know? all wore yellow sheds for years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the wall behind you, and there's one of Casper, Freddie Perry. Yeah, that's like for a, bench press. Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like another funny uh, just ripple. Yeah. Rad. Okay, last uh, last thing, Yosh. Uh, you want to throw any thank yous before we wrap this thing up? Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I want to thank you guys for like having me on and like giving me a platform to tell my story. And, um, yeah, my, all my friends and family, like my mom and dad, my brother, like, um, I think like it wasn't always (laughs) easy, but like, um, to see like my vision, but like, you know, everybody came around and like my parents are super proud of me now for like, what I've accomplished and like the world that I live in and like, um, can be hard sometimes. Cause you don't know, like when I was a kid, like a professional snowboard photographer, are you kidding me? Like didn't really like, there was maybe like a handful of people doing that. So like, and like a handful of people aside from that who were successful at it. So, um, yeah, thanks for always having me, having my back. And then, um, also just like all the riders, you know, like, um, man, like there's just been so many epic riders that I've gotten to work with. And like, I just so grateful and privileged to have like call these people, my friend and work with these people that are just like, not only like the best snowboarders in the world, but the most creative people in the world and also like the best humans in the world. And that's just like kind of a testament to the community that we live in. Like, um, yeah. So thank you. And thanks to all the, um, photographers and filmers as well you know like um i've shot a lot alongside a lot of photographers and filmers and it's not always like friendly you know so like um but like when it works out and we can like work together it's like beneficial for everyone so like thanks for thanks for maybe like taking a half step back with the century you know or like (laughs) you're leaning in yeah or even just like hey like 
after he gets the trick, can you like step out so I can get like the plate photo to like Photoshop you out? Like that little stuff like that, you know, like let's like work together. So like doesn't always have to be a battle. So thanks to all those guys and like, yeah, nothing but love. And um, yeah, thank you. Man, Yosh, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. It's been a fun banter journey. Of course, Bertner, thanks for coming on. It's been awesome to hear more about my good friend, Mike. Mm-hmm. Hell of a hell of a chat. So, th- and uh, lastly, thank you, Silk, so much for uh, running the boards back there and everything you do. A pleasure. And again, Yosh, appreciate you everything you've done for snowboarding, and uh, really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story. And then, lastly, our listeners, everybody that supports all the sponsors, um, we really appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, we got another one next week. Over and out from the bomb hole. <laughs>